bond yields are being pinned because the Fed is talking tough at this point and the market realizes that. We were bracing for a higher for longer environment with a higher cost of capital. It's the end of free money and we think it's a good thing. I just wonder whether there's a turning point happening now which isn't visible yet. When you see this kind of volatility, especially in the yields, it's the concentration of risks that will cause something to break. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get you to the weekend. Let's get you to October. Live from New York City <laughs> yeah. this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P with a lift trying to end a brutal month on a high. Your equity market on the S&P up by 0.5%. TK, I think we can call this a month to forget. It's a month to forget. It's a quarter to forget as well. A lot of moving parts here. And of course, this morning we see just the same uh, tensions that we've seen all through the week. I'm going to go back to something said months and months ago. I did a wonderful panel with him for Bloomberg, Nassim Taleb, the acclaimed black swan quantitative finance expert. And he said, the gravity has returned to the market. It was a grave September. That gravitational pull, Tom, over the last yeah. month or so gets a little bit stronger in the bond market. What a range we've seen, Bramo, in the last 24 hours. The high of the session yesterday, 468.61, just south of 470 on a 10-year. This morning, we're at 454. And I'm not sure what that turnaround is based on, Bramo. How much new information did we get in the last day or so? Maybe we got softer than expected inflation data out of Europe. Maybe you got $2 billion of bond buying out of the Bank of Japan that did very little for the actual market. I'm just curious how much we're looking at volatility in treasuries, unlike anything we're seeing in credit or stocks oh. at this point. This is where suddenly bond markets are really what's showing the volatility that normally is associated with very different asset classes. I don't know who we have in the uh, 8D block, the last voice that we'll hear here across our three hours, but I'm certain in the first block on Monday, we had young Luke Kawa of UBS, and he said it right to your idea of volatility. We're now into the first and second derivatives across all the asset classes. And that's why you see David Weston with Ray Dalio today, a bit of tension. You see Danny Berger with Lawrence Fink, a bit of tension. Yeah. There's a whole lot of tension around the great and worthy right now. For whatever it's worth, 845 Eastern Time, Oliver Chen of Cowan. Is it Oliver you Chen? Talk retail so we'll be talking luxury. retail we'll fashion. What to later. buy at Celine that won't shrink Okay, we're going to do that again. That sounds like fun. Let's talk bird. about some news. The potential <laughs> for some you. real news. <laughs> Two deadlines. UAW a little bit later this morning. Government shutdown looming going into the weekend. Bramo, what's your focus on? UAW or Washington, D.C.? I'm actually more focused on UAW because Washington, D.C. seems like almost a certainty uh, that there's going to be a shutdown. There's a real question around how Biden will shut the government down because he does have some discretion on that front. But really, it comes to how entrenched are wage pressures? How much can companies keep passing along to workers versus taking for themselves in terms of profitability? This is something that's broadening. We're seeing this, pressures, uh, this pressure build. And to me, I mean, Larry Fink, Tom mentioned this. He also said that corporate executives and officials have not done a good job explaining just how entrenched inflation really is becoming in the economy. Based on our reporting, the ask comes down from 40 to 36 and down to 30. We'll build on that a little bit later. Your equity market looks like this on the S&P 500. There is a lift. We're positive by 0.4%. We're still down just about on the week coming into Friday, down on the month on the S&P 500, not just in the equity market, in treasuries too. Bonds down, stocks down, that hurts. Yields lower this morning by three basis points, 454, Lisa, in the bond market. It has been an exceptional month. What I'm watching today might be the last slew of data that we actually get before the government shutdown delays a whole bunch of data. 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. personal income and spending. I'm more curious to talk about that and how much consumer discretionary funds are still available rather than Celine and shrinking sweatshirts. I also am curious about core PCE, which will come out the favored measure by the Fed for inflation. Yes, it's expected to come in, but upward revisions expected from previous months. So watch that. 10 a.m. University of Michigan sentiment survey. I know a lot of questions around the validity of something that surveys three people, but at the same time, not that many. There are many more than that. I understand that. But I'm looking right now at the expectations five to 10 years forward of inflation, because if you look at markets, it has gotten sticky at two point something, 2.4. 2.5. This is not the Fed's 2% target over the next 5 to 10 years. And at 10 a.m., there is that UAW announcement ahead of the 12 noon deadline for strike expansion. A real question about whether they are going to go after uh, still Stellantis and GM, whether they're going to broaden to Ford, whether they mark progress with 30% wage increases. And that's the line in the sand, as you just mentioned, John. A Facebook Live event about four hours away with the UAW president. For whatever it's worth, that Celine sweatshirt now is has like bleach stains on it as well. So 
it's so it's really drunk and it's, it's like you know that pink dye <laughs> yes. forget about that oh man julian okay. with us around the table <laughs> julian emmanuel chief equity and quantitative strategist over at evercore julian fantastic to catch up with you sir good morning always oh, great to be here let's talk about that pullback in this equity market is it time to buy it is so you hit on two very important themes just now. The first, the concept of a bit of tension, okay? The wall of worry that was almost non-existent in July as AI was leading us to the new world and then suddenly started getting rebuilt at the top is now fully rebuilt. And how do we know that? Because basically, if you look at the market yesterday, there was a very, very noticeable change when the UAW came out and lowered the, their offer, making the bid offer spread 21 to 30, as opposed to that original 40. And that's when bond yields turn lower, and that's when stocks turn higher. And we think there's a lot more to go of that type of action in the fourth So this quarter. equity call you're making is essentially a bond market call, correct? How can it be otherwise when you look at the action in the last year and a half? The two are positively correlated. It's a new world. I, I want to talk, and I'm, I'm fired up this morning because i got great and worthies running around the world spouting economics, and it just drives me absolutely <laughs> nuts. Let's get back to common sense. You work for the most famous market economist in the world. Edward S. Hyman invented the game. I want to get from Ed Hyman to Julian Emanuel. What is that linkage across the Hyman predicted disinflation? So Ed's call, again, disinflation, it has been very consistent. And what's interesting about the current environment is it's very rare that you see oil prices ratcheting higher the way they have, whereas copper prices have been going lower. That tells you that what's going on is more geopolitical than an entrenched inflation psychology. That's going to continue to unwind, right. uh, likely a slowdown. But the commonality here is when you look long term, the reason the market is likely on better footing in the fourth quarter is because earnings are going to continue to grow next year. Tell me about the character of nominal GDP, the animal spirit. Hyman, he's looking at freight cars. He's looking at pickup trucks. He knows what Taylor Swift's going to drink at the football game <laughs> this weekend. Ed's omniscient, okay? Take his research and bring it over to nominal GDP and to the top line revenue growth that generates that earnings enthusiasm. Well, the first thing you got to say is it's interesting because now there's a reason to watch the Jets game uh, live for maybe the first time in years because Taylor <laughs> Swift may or may not be there. Look, the, the, the fact is, is that, again, part of why this environment has been so difficult is because the economy is so incredibly diverse. And actually, when you look at, at Ed and Oscar's surveys, what we've seen was the trucking survey telling us that we should have been in a recession for the last nine months. But because the manufacturing side is so much smaller than the services side and the airline survey has been on fire, literally for years. We all know how difficult going through airports are, and we all know how much uh, air, air uh, prices have gone up, is that the economy, again, this diversity, is likely going to get us through so that even if we get a downturn, it's mild. I never took you for a Swifty. I just am throwing that out there. It wasn't really on my radar. <laughs> what are you buying then? Because if there is this bifurcation in the markets between different industries that are going through recessions at different times, what's going to lead the drive back to 4450 by year end? So we think you need to be really thematic and really focused here. The energy story has is absolutely going to continue to play out. Again, this is geopolitics more than anything, but geopolitics is going to keep uh, the oil price elevated, we think, certainly until next November. Uh, so it, it again, the only sector that basically is pricing in a recession. Uh, healthcare, which is actually immune to geopolitics and interest rate gyrations, very good secular story. And what we like, again, uh, the generative AI, it's not just the arms merchants, you know, the, the stocks that we thought that, that armed the Internet in the 90s. It's not just those, but it's the companies that have been front foot forward in terms of implementing generative AI. And we're going to be paying very close attention to earnings conference calls in the month of October to see who's doing what and to see what kind of ideas they have in terms of implementation. Those stocks will outperform long term. Right now, as you take a look at the idea of more volatility heading into a really potentially fraught election cycle, 
How much does that actually make you favor bonds? Because typically you have to adjust for a higher risk premium in the more volatile instruments. Are bonds less volatile than stocks in this kind of environment? Well, they certainly haven't been uh, for most of the last year and a half. Uh, but again, uh, look, we know the Fed is likely about to pause. Maybe there's one more hike left and that QT will continue to run in the background. So we don't really have to worry about what the messaging is there. But it, it, it comes back to this whole idea that when you look at the energy complex, it is sort of off by itself. And so therefore, the case for bonds becomes a little bit more interesting to us. Two of the most powerful quotes in the past week came out of Bank of America, the CEO, the CFO. It needs to be talked about way more. Brian Moynihan, we won't have a recession. The CFO, it's difficult to see a recession when the consumer is spending 4% more year over year. Can you identify any evidence of a slowdown that's going to lead to a recession anytime soon? Well, you actually did see the consumption number ease a, a little bit yesterday. Um, and, but frankly, when, when we look at, again, uh, the weekly jobless claims number is, is the thing that we're focused on, and it is very strong. But, but here's the thing. We know there are some of these things building in the background that have traditionally, 70 years, been pretty good indicators of recession. LEIs, loan officers survey, the yield curve, et cetera. It doesn't mean that the recession is eliminated. In our view, it, this is a case of the economic cycle because right. of all the money we threw out being elongated. The value to growth ratio is a record low, essentially a record low. Values never underperform growth like it has recently. Do you just stay with growth or do you buy the value trap? No, I, I think you have to, again, be very, very targeted. Because if you think about it... Well, targeted uh, what? Free ca Help me out here. Free no, cash flow? Well, it, it, it's a different story. Right now, there's a valuation edge in areas like energy, which are throwing off ridiculous amounts. I mean, insane amounts of free cash flow. Uh, and, and healthcare, which, you know, despite regulation, continues to be a one-way ticket uh, because of the demographic tailwinds. Uh, and, and again, anything that is associated with generative AI is likely to be a company that's also throwing off good free cash flow. Are you going to the Jets game this weekend? No, my Minnesota Vikings okay. have made a misery of professional Have we confirmed whether Taylor Swift is attending said game, TK? I clocked a scarlet foo last night. Celebrity <laughs> okay. loads to the Bloomberg <laughs> surveillance. And, and foo was working the phones all day with Taylor's people. <laughs> okay. And we don't know. It's Jets. For those of you not up to speed on this, like I'm the only one on the planet that's not up to speed on this, Scarlet briefed me, the Jets, Chiefs, not really a football game. I think it'll be 70 to 20 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and will Miss Swift show up in support of one of the chiefies? And, you know, then it the goes from... Travis Kelsey. What, yeah, what's the relationship yeah. there? And, the, the, you know, does she wear an eagle It's the important swag? stuff. You want to talk <laughs> the money side of it. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, his just just money sales have exploded. We, yes, I As know. I understand, the price to get into MetLife is up something like 20% really? this weekend. I didn't weekend, know that. Even without confirmation. Now, email I'm just right saying now. that even <laughs> yeah. if they're not together, yeah. just constructing some kind of relationship for well, PR purposes yeah. may well sound more jersey. Are jerseys, you skeptical? Fill out stadiums are you skeptical and of the actual love tickets? between I'm these not, two? I'm not saying... I mean, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if it were constructed for... For PR sake, for external consumption, see? that there are Travis's benefits. mom looked pretty happy <laughs> on Sunday, didn't she? Did you she? see there are all these memes on Twitter on X about P like the PR person for Kelsey just like sitting back? And being no, no, like, but Let's seriously, go. folks, you, I know you don't talk to me. You talk to John and Lisa because you love them and you hate me. Send in your notes to John and Lisa. Should we set up a countdown clock? for a Taylor appearance at our 3 a.m. at our 3 a.m. conference call. If this doesn't this work out, <laughs> can you imagine the amount of hate mail he's going to get? <laughs> well, it's it like, depends how it doesn't work out. It's got to work out, otherwise it's just lose-lose so for this guy. you getting married, is that what you're saying? I'm just saying it's got to work out. <laughs>
without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expect. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I know Sunday is football day. It is the weekend. Sometimes we get right there, we play through. We, we, we get into overtime, we get it done. I've got, got conversations as early as this morning with Democratic senators. They want something on the border, they're working on it. And so I think there's an opportunity, opportunity here. We know we have to keep the government funded. The clock is ticking. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy there going into the weekend with a deadline just around the corner. Live from New York City, closing out the week, closing out the month closing out the quarter. Your equity market looks like this on the S&P 500. Attempted to bounce going into the close of the month. Equities up by 0.5% on the S&P 500. Yields come in just a couple of basis points. We're down three. Call it four basis points lower on a 10-year. 453.83 after coming really close to 470 in yesterday's session. The euro's done it all this week. It's had a look at 104. It's having a look at 106. The euro 106.14. Stronger euro, weaker dollar at 106.14. We're positive here by 0.45%. And tons to talk about in Japan. The yeah. BOJ coming into the bond market and sucking up some JGBs, Bramo. There's been a feeling that maybe they're letting things go in the bond market to try and put a lid on this move in dollar yen. Adam Ruskin of Deutsche Bank was talking about that. So based on the intervention we've seen in the week, are they more concerned about what's happening in the bond market than they are about maybe what's happening in foreign exchange? And how concerned are they exactly? I mean, how committed are they to some kind of move? Because either, either the intervention that they did in the currency market, not that big, wasn't that durable. The intervention that they did in the bond market was $2 billion worth that did basically nothing in curtailing some of the biggest move upward and the highest rates that we've seen on 20-year and 30-year JGPs going back to 2014. So not clear what this commitment is. Is it the beginning of something more durable or is this the beginning of something that's basically like, eh, you know, just slow down, guys. It's like a, a warning shot. Yeah, exactly. But it's like a, a water pistol. Yes. You know, there's like not much going exactly. on at all. That's kind of like the opening opening I shots read, coming I, from I, the BOJ. First of all, our, our reporting out of Tokyo on this was phenomenal. It was really world class. And you just wonder where it goes. And John, I'm looking at knock-on effects across Asia. I get dollar, yen, euro, yen, but I'm just as interested in Aussie yen or yen Indonesian rupiah. I, I just, I, I think there's some real nuances here. Off the back of the stronger dollar story, TK? Yeah. Over the, the last few months? This, well, on a busted... A busted theory from from Japan. I mean, it, flat out, it's a busted theory. None of this is in the textbooks. None of it. I all. agree with you. They've let yeah. it go to something like three quarters of 1% on a 10-year. Yeah. Clearly, they've got a little bit of appetite to slow that down. But let's see yeah. how far that can go, Tom. Uh, real yield, 2.16% here. There's still tension in the air on a Friday. Brown University's got some really, really cool things. One of them is the Center for Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. They hold court at 25 George Street. It's a leafy, perfect building. Looks like it's off a movie set out of revolutionary America. And of course, that leads us to the founding fathers and someone who studies this, Wendy Schiller, director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy, expert on the Founding Fathers. Let me cut to the chase, Professor Schiller. Would the Founding Fathers have shut down the government? No. Uh, Hamilton in particular would not have wanted to shut down the government because he believed in uh, the government being an engine of economic stability uh, and grounding for the economy. So, no. And, you know, the American public has a, a, a less, you know, a less voracious appetite for shutting the government down than they did maybe 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I always argue the Republicans won by shutting the government down in 2013. They did. They win the Senate in 2014. But in 20, you know, 17, 18, Trump sort of ultimately caved after 30, 35 days on that. And then the 18 elections, the 20, the 22 elections haven't been stellar for the Republican Party. So you're seeing more concern among moderate Republicans vocally about a shutdown than you have in previous um, threatening times about a shutdown. That's an interesting dynamic going into this weekend. You know, the Freedom Caucus, they'll win if they shut the government down for a couple of days to make their point. They get more border security money and they open the government back up in about a week. You know, does some damage, but they end up, you know, muscling, yeah. showing their muscle and then border security. But it also helps Biden. This is what I don't understand about the Republicans. You're going to waste money with a shutdown. Then you're going to get more right. money for border security. And Biden benefits from that. Wendy, we had a congressman on yesterday from southeastern Wisconsin between Chicago and Milwaukee removed from the politics of grievance. How do we get out of this doom loop 
of woe is me grievance within the GOP party. How do we extract ourselves from where we are to a better civics? Tom, um, you know, honestly, this is where individual figures in American politics matter. Donald Trump matters on this because he, A, he's running, B, he's got a lead now in the primary, and his whole politics is grievance. It's personal grievance most of the time for Donald Trump. But in 2016, he ran on national grievance, right? He ran on, you know, there's too much crime. Uh, we're all unhappy. The economy isn't as good as it should be. I can fix it. He kept saying, I can fix it. His entire, you know, uh, uh, gestalt, right? A political gestalt is about grievance. So as long as he is a major public figure with a lot of support amongst a, a slice of the Republican Party, you cannot rid our politics of grievance. Um, it will just be here minimally till November 24. In the meantime, when we talk about the potential for a shutdown, there was a Wall Street Journal article outlining how there is a loophole that gives the uh, chief executive, which would be the president, some discretion over how painful uh, the shutdown would be in terms of what gets closed, what remains open. Is there any incentive for President Biden to make it more painful or less painful in terms of allowing passports to get processed, keeping some of the national parks open, things of that nature? Lisa, that is a really fantastic question. You know, if, it was, if the election wasn't a year away, yes, you know, he would have some incentive to really inflicting pain, particularly in areas that tend to be more Republican dominated. But since most voters will say, I'm going to a national park, the president it runs the country, and now it's closed and my vacation is ruined, they will blame Biden. So I don't think he has the same kind of flexibility right now that maybe past presidents had, given the timetable and the way that voters are sort of dividing the blame right now for whether government's working or not. Meanwhile, uh, Chris Newsom of uh, California seems to be Governor Newsom and keeps coming out and acting almost as the defender of President Biden, even as a lot of people wonder whether he's about to run. What do you make of his role in all of this and sort of one of the biggest mouthpieces suddenly uh, for the Democratic Party? Um, Lisa, I'm not sure Gavin Newsom actually does Biden favors. I mean, I think we can all probably put money down. That California will be Democratic in the Electoral College for 2024. And it's just unclear to me how he helps because California is more liberal than Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona and Georgia, to say a few. So to name a few. So I'm, I'm just not sure how it helps, but it does help himself. Just in case Biden falters or there's some semblance that Biden won't run, I think he is trying to do right by the Democratic Party, but also keep his name out there and be in the public eye. So he thinks it's a win-win. I'm not positive it's a win-win for Joe Biden. Well, Wendy, what do you think the White House thinks about it? I think they're annoyed. I mean, John, wouldn't you be annoyed? I mean, you know, the, you don't need anybody else defining the message of the Democratic Party, particularly the governor of a state that is clearly blue. Uh, you know, if Gretchen Whitmer wanted to go out there and defend Biden all the time, um, you know, uh, I think that that might be more uh, palatable to Joe Biden. So, we'll, you know, we'll see. But I think there are, you know, people in the Democratic Party that are saying we have to have a plan B. We have to have some set of people that we can turn to in case Biden falters considerably or for some reason decides not to run. Is your base case still that he will run? I think if he's walking, breathing and talking, he's running. Yeah. I don't think okay. there's any way Joe Biden steps away. Um, and I, you know, I hope I, I wish every politician, you know, good health. I don't want anyone to go anywhere. But um, I think he believes, A, he's the only one who could definitely beat Trump because he already has. And B, because he has enough experience, he's doing good things for government. As long as he can still do that, he's not going anywhere. Wendy Schiller of Brown University. That's Wendy, great. thank you for the update. Sneak peek of 2024, Tom. All of that's still to come next year. She's so blood. If they're walking, talking, breathing, breathing, that's your quality. Is that, is that where the bar we is? We should remind right everybody that Professor Schiller right has down. one of the definitive civics textbooks in America. I, I mean, she bought, she, Gina Raimondo and her, so they're on Best, best Buds. Didn't know that. She owns, Wendy owns like half of Newport off the royalties of it. Newport's nice. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's nice. You know, Been there know, before. The Black Pearl and the Late Dockside. Summer. Yeah, and, sure. Lovely. Know. Okay. The landing. More on Tom's American Go out tour the landing. a little bit later. <laughs> you should do a vacation show. I'd, I'd love to see a travel show. Yeah, you. I should. That'd be very cool. Newport. And I'm Ruskin at Deutsche Bank. <laughs> Coming up shortly. Just waking up, you want the Ryder Cup update? Europe versus the United States. Dan Rappaport of Barstool Sports says go back to bed. Europe crushing it. 
More on that a little bit later. Equities on the S&P. Yeah, I'm Dead. glad you bring this Look up. Look like this <laughs> on the S&P 500. <laughs> Futures up by half of 1%. We'll do that later. Let's see if the score changes. <laughs> the Nasdaq up by 0.7%. We are up on the session. We are down on the month and it's been a difficult month of September. First quarterly loss, Tom, potentially for the S&P 500 of the year yeah. so far. Well, it's interesting. We end September. We end the quarter here. A challenge. I can tell you the tape today summed it up within correlations is better than good off of Wednesday and Thursday. But, John, that's at uh, 6.30 Wall Street time. Where are we going to be at 12 noon? Where are we going to be at 2 p.m. as we go into the close? It's, uh, Where are we going to be the next time the Fed meets based yeah. on these bond market moves? Yeah. Because they've been absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Let's look at them. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Things are settling down. Yeah. Settling down in the last 24 well hours. We've well backed said. away from close to 470 on a 10-year, all the way back down to about 454 currently. We're down three basis points on the day. The two-year, just in and around 5% still, 5.037% on a two-year. Also down a couple of basis points down the two-year. Interesting for Julian Emmanuel of Evercore to link the bond market move to the reports out of UAW that they would take, Tom, maybe a 30% pay raise instead uh -huh. of 36 or or 40 and he thinks perhaps just closing that spread, contributing to a little bit of firmness in the Treasury market as well. I don't know where you stand on that, but that was Julian's view in the last 30 minutes. I, I'm not standing pretty much on anything right now. I think there's so many narratives, so many cross currents going on. I look at this, Lisa, and I just say uh, uh, to myself, I'm going to read and think about the optionality that people like Alan Ruskin are giving us. Well, it just shows us the volatility uh, implied by the lack of understanding of this inflation, how durable it is. If the UAW shifts its stance and suddenly that moves the entire multi-trillion right. dollar U.S. bond market, but, it raises a question about where we are in terms of inflation expectations and right. understanding. Tom Purcelli of Pigeon was heated yesterday that even with those UAW union wage increases, wages are ebbing. We're getting a disinflationary tendency on an aggregate basis here. Why don't we go under since we got such an esteemed guest? Well, I wanted to get to foreign exchange first, TK, so okay, let me do, do that. Exchange. The it's euro poised, poised, yeah. poised, poised for an 11th week of weakness against the US dollar. Let's see if we can turn that around to today's session. So, Lisa, here we are on the euro against the dollar at 106.11. Earlier in the week, had a look at 104. We've backed away since then. This currency pairs firmer by 0.4%, but so much weaker over the last couple of months. Have we reached a level, though, where it is poised to strengthen? And that really is a key question for me at a time where we saw inflation data come in favorably for the euro region, right. come in lower than expected, and yet you're seeing strength in the currency. So this, to me, it really highlights where we are and, and the difficulty, right. frankly, for the ECB. Into the weekend, massive weekend reading, Nomura getting out front, Jordan Rochester questioning, do we need to begin to frame out euro parity? It just is a, a basic idea. Do we get further weaker euro? Well, he texted me earlier. The yeah. question was parity or 110. <laughs> parity or 110. <laughs> yes. It's like, take your pick, pick your poison right yeah. now and in leaning towards the idea that perhaps we belong closer to parity than we do at 110 we're somewhere in between right now under surveillance this morning we're less than 48 hours away from a possible government shutdown house speaker kevin mccarthy struggling to get hardline republicans to approve a short-term continuing resolution to avoid 49, one 40, white house staff 47. were told to brace for furloughs and the treasury said most irs services would pause at least we're getting closer it's just around the corner and the key question here is how long it could potentially last and whether Kevin McCarthy has the role of House Speaker when it is finished. I think that really, to me, is the bigger question. What is his leadership like, especially at a time where his party is not one that can be led, given how he got to that position and given the fact that people are not looking to him for influence? They're looking for him to sort of like, you know, kind of herd cats. Is it that binary? Is it shut down or new speaker? You know, it's a good question. I don't think that that's the case. But there is this issue where if he brings to, to the floor a vote, that could potentially alienate some of the people in his party. That said, there might be some measure passed that gives him a pass, sort of a Hail Mary that gets around it. Right. But these are the sort of mechanics that people are looking at and saying, it's going to shut down. The key question is how long and what the damage well, is. That's the deadline for the weekend. Let's talk about another deadline today. The UAW saying the strike against the big three automakers will expand at noon unless progress is made. Union President Sean Fain expected to give an update on Facebook Live at 10 a.m. According to our reporting here at Bloomberg, the workers are ready to accept a 30 percent pay raise down from the initial 40 percent sort at the start of the strike. So we're closing the gap, TK. 
just a little bit more going into this deadline later this morning. I wonder the other items. That's all. I, I think you're yeah. right. The Facebook call is important. 12 noon is important. Their strategy is original to say the least. But, I, you know, it's just to me, it's not just about pay. It's about getting back to some form of pre-collapse in 07, whenever it was. Step one towards doing that, yeah. potentially, Tom. Maybe more tension on the horizon. I want to squeeze this in. Nike shares rising after the company reported earnings that beat estimates. The sportswear giant also reporting a drop in a stockpile of inventory. A sign is making progress in moving out older merchandise for newer, more profitable items. The stock seems to like the news, that's for sure, Tom. We're up by close to 8% in the pre-market on Nike, 96.61 after some pretty terrible news elsewhere. When you think yeah. about what we heard from Dick Sporting Goods, what we got from Foot Locker, direct to consumer when it comes yeah. to Nike, maybe a little bit better, Bramo, based on what we've heard from the company after the close yesterday. And you see the knock on effects with the Adidas and others that see also their Adidas. shares popping ahead of the market. But I, to me, I this. I heard that and I love it. Okay, thanks. No I worries. Try. Okay. It's a, I actually am shifting. Tom, I'm not quite TK's to petrol yet or aluminium, it. but I am in Adidas because I get it. I get it. They're a German company. Thanks. But what my point was is that as they clear out inventory, there's this feeling that maybe they've got more pricing power. And then that goes to that sort of stickier inflation call as well <coughs> because the direct consumer brands. I know. I'm, I know. I'm so young worth, brand. When we were kids in the UK, we used to call Nike Nike. That was a that was a British thing. Really? Okay, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not for a long time, there. we used to yeah, say yeah. Nike instead okay. of Nike. <laughs> that's very funny. I think I did that for for quite a few decades until maybe I moved here. <laughs> and it was, um, it's Nike and Tom, it's up in the pre-market. Joining us now to save the show, Alan Ruskin, Chief International Strategist at Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank. <laughs> and we're thrilled he could join us this morning because he has an incredible note out on American exceptionalism. Alan, I just love what you say about the good and the bad of where we are. Within this market turmoil, there's that whole feeling on a Friday, wait, we're American, we'll persevere, we'll get through this. Describe how America's different given the bond instability we see. Tom, look, I think uh, there's plenty of good. Uh, a lot of it relates to longer term growth factors. Uh, the US is very competitive in a, an array of different uh, industries, new and old. Uh, the geopolitics, I think, is uh, very helpful as well. Uh, in the defense industry, uh, in semiconductors, is uh, just uh, you know two industries. But uh, on the negative side, and perhaps not focused on all that much until very recently, has been what's been going on in the public sector deficit and uh, a cyclically adjusted general government deficit of uh, minus six percent or minus seven percent, as far as the eye can see. Uh, would not be seen as uh, sustainable for right. any country other than perhaps the United States. With the Putin invasion, David Fulkert's Landau is out front on this. Now, we had in America what Olivier Blanchard calls the Biden stimulus, a series of stimuli. And folks, we know we got to the last one and away we went. We don't have that crutch anymore, Alan Ruskin. How are we going to get the fiscal support that your colleague David Fulkert's Landau talks about? Well, hopefully we won't need the fiscal support to the extent that uh, what you're seeing on the public sector side does have a mirror image uh, on the private sector side. So the deficit on the public sector side is offset to a large extent by the surplus on the private sector side. And, and that's why the current account, which usually is the sort of thing that's flashing red, particularly for, you know, for foreign exchange guys, that has not been flashing red at this point in time. To me, the problem that you're seeing right now is more about the financing of the public sector deficit. Uh, and you're seeing that you know, sort of disconcerted um, um, movement in the bond market, I think, is reflective of that. The fact that the Fed's doing QT, the fact that China and Japan are not necessarily buying, all the onus and burden is falling on the household sector, which normally, you know, in directly only holds about 10% of outstanding treasuries. That is a unique set of circumstance. And I think it's draining liquidity from the banking sector as the household sector shifts from deposits into treasuries. And it's exacerbating the banking sector problem. Alan, I wanted to bring up something Steve Major mentioned over at HSBC that I think contributes to this conversation. Alan, he made the point that what's important here is not just the deficit, it's the deficit at a time where we have an expansion and not a contraction in the U.S. economy. How vital is that point, Alan? 
Yeah, and I think that's exactly why we sort of cyclically adjust these things. So we kind of like, you know, you know, you might have somewhat better public sector data right now, but when you cyclically adjust it, you know, allow for, you know, measures like output gaps, et cetera, uh, you get a better sense of the trend. And the trend is very poor, really. I think that's, you know, that's, that's the key point. Uh, you know, I think most estimates suggest the general government deficit of six to seven percent. But those numbers that I just mentioned are, are, are reasonable. Is there any chance, Alan, that then you could see some sort of weakening cycle in the dollar following the incredible strength that we've seen over the past few months, simply because the backdrop is deteriorating and some data is coming out better than expected from the likes of Europe and even China on the peripheries? Yeah, I think, you know, what you're seeing on this side, at least from the financing side, is initially whilst bond yields are backing up, it's actually you know, quite positive for the dollar. It can be very positive for the dollar versus EM and commodity currencies. I think uh, you know, when you get too much of a good sort of good thing, uh, at least in foreign exchange terms, and you know, bond yields back up more than the Fed would want, you could get into a situation where the Fed's essentially lost control of the back end of the curve uh, and the economy is slowing, and then they have to cut rates much more aggressively at the front end. And when you reach any of that sort of point uh, where uh, the yield curve is starting to steepen sharply, uh, you know, and it's the front end that's leading the steepening, that would be a major dollar negative. I think that's a story that could be around for the second half of 2024. It's not a story for the end of 2023. Alan, just to sort of build on that, are you saying that right now it seems like the Fed is losing control over the long end of the yield curve, that what we're seeing seems a little unmoored and uh, not good for the Fed officials that are watching it? Not yet, I would say. And, and you're seeing this in terms of Fed officials not really talking about excessive financial conditions tightening. I think at this point in time, they recognize that that perhaps there wasn't sufficient tightening uh, from financial conditions, uh, led not least by a very well-behaved bond market. But I think we're seeing the beginnings of an unraveling, and we watch. We have to watch this very, very closely because the financing element is truly in a unique phase in terms of this dependence on the household sector. And I really wanted a word on the BOJ and what's happened in the JGB market. The BOJ stepping in. <clears throat> Do you get the impression that the Japanese authorities are more concerned about the bond market move than maybe they are the foreign exchange move? I think they're sort of straddling a, a fine line here. I don't think they want, uh, you know, dollar yen uh, much above uh, 150 or above 150 at all. Um, there's, I don't think it's a firm line in the sand. I think they've used the bond market. They've uh, effectively allowed the JGB heels in the 10-year sector to drift up to protect the 150 level of late. So um, it might look like a contradiction right now in terms of intervening of the bond market, but I think the tendency over time will be for that 10-year heel to drift up. It's just going to have to drift up slowly, I think, in terms of you know, what the BOJ is signaling. Alan, thank you, sir, for the update this morning. And great note on the BOJ yesterday as well. Enjoyed that read. Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank. And in there on the BOJ at the end there, TK. Okay. And I'm making the point yesterday that maybe the Japanese authorities were tolerating high yields in the JGB market yeah, to I... try and put a cap on what's happening here in the FX market. Now, based on a move overnight, maybe you can draw a different conclusion. But I think, as you pointed out there, Tom, this delicate dance right. between these two opposing forces, yields higher in the Japanese government bond market, and at the same time, this yen weakness you're seeing in foreign exchange, it's a difficult moment for the BOJ to work out the right kind of balance going into year end. Well, let's go back to first principles here. And this is off of Matt Winkler's wonderful work, our uh, editor-in-chief emeritus, who just was in Japan and did some great work on maybe how the deflation has benefited the Japanese people. They've decided to impute an inflation into the system. One, have they overshot that? and created too much inflation, not like England, but too much inflation. And then the other thing that's absolutely critical, as Alan Ruskin alluded to, and you did, out the yield curve, does UEDA control how far out the yield curve? He does not control 10 years and out right now. No end if or buts about that. Trying to change something about that, Tom, this morning at least. Coming up on the crude market, 96 on Brent, 92 on WTI. Stephen Shork of the Shork Group. Oh, good. Up next. Wonderful. Do you really think we need another uh, another rate move to bring down inflation? Too early for me to know. Um, I think there are a wide range of possible outcomes. You could argue for a resurgence based on the numbers 
we've been seeing. You could argue for a downturn, as you've been talking about, and you could argue for a return to the pre-COVID uh, economy. I think all of those are, are in sight. That was helpful. Thomas Barkin, the Richmond Fed president, sitting down with Bloomberg's Mike McKee. Yeah, Mike but- is one of the best. The range of outcomes they still see on this FOMC TK is just phenomenal. They tell us that the soft landing is not the baseline. It's still the objective. But you just go through these outcomes. Let me repeat what Barkin just said to Mike McKee. You could argue for a resurgence based on the numbers we've been seeing. You could argue for a downturn, as you've been talking right. about. And you could argue for a return to the pre-COVID economy. I think all of those are in sight. That's a business guy and consultant setting up the choice set or optionality they have forward. And because we're America, unlike other central banks, we have larger degrees of freedom to wiggle around depending what the data is. Barkin's just going to wait to see what the data is. And given that, Tom, when they see the three potential outcomes that way, what do you do? You just wait, don't you? That you doesn't just sound wait. like a guy that's and, got tons of conviction to do something. I'm on a warpath today about people blathering on about guesstimating and forecasting what the economy is. You know, everybody's going to publish this weekend, gaping over at Bank of America, Hotsius, Goldman Sachs. Everybody else is going to publish, and I really care what they think because they're working 24-7 on this stuff. Well, at a certain point, you have to come up with a base case. If the base cases are so wide and you can drive a truck through it, it raises a question about volatility and how you price volatility and why it's not being Fair. priced in more aggressively, both in yield premia what as have well spreads as... spreads done this week? They've actually climbed considerably. They've you can widened see out, they've showing widened. more so fear. Exactly. Okay. So you are feeling a little bit of that on the margins, but at a certain point, the volatility in and of itself is something people have to start to price. I couldn't agree more. A TK. I'm not sure they've got a base case right now, and if they have, they're not sharing it with us. Based on the forecast we got last week, which screamed soft landing, if you think we can get inflation down to 2%, 2.0 flat, with unemployment not climbing much higher than 4%, then you're in the soft landing camp. The problem is, I'm not sure he wanted to spend too much time talking about the medium projections, TK, <laughs> of the Federal Reserve, based on the performance we saw in the news conference yeah. last Wednesday. One of the things we learned in Jackson Hole was they drive out west. You know, you go out for a quart of milk and you drive 40 miles and that's no big deal. You know, you, you go into the, you need a beverage, you go into the million dollar cowboy bar and it's an 80 mile trip there and back. Driving past it's the not bison. like New York, you know. Yeah. A gallon of gas matters, right? It does. It does matter. And right now a gallon of gas is going up. Uh, John, what do we got here? We got West Texas Intermediate, $92. Brent crude, $96 a barrel. Joining us from the most expensive gallon of gas in the nation, Los Angeles, Stephen Shork. He's principal of the Shork Group with incredible, incredible microanalysis of the distillates. What's a jet fuel look like at JFK or LAX? How diesel is diesel? Let's go there, Stephen, into the weekend. Worldwide, diesel's upset. Why is diesel that goes in my ancient VW rabbit, why is mm-hmm. diesel topsy-turvy? Well, absolutely, because it's the least um, market where you'll see a margin for refineries. So a refinery, their goal is always to maximize the amount of gasoline that is being produced. So distillate or diesel fuel always comes in second place. Now, with the way that shifting from a government policy, from a taxation policy, there is a market that is under strain. Right now, we're going into the peak demand season for diesel fuel. So you have intermodal demand here in Los Angeles, in Southern California, with all of the freight that comes into the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. Those goods have to be shipped to shelves to get ready for the uh, marketing, se- uh, the Christmas season. We also have the harvest now in the Midwest. So there's a tremendous right. amount of demand for off-road diesel. Supplies are just really low, Tom. And when you have low supplies, high demand, there's only one way for prices to go. I believe oil's up and the Steve Shark world is not up as much. Do you just assume a gallon of gas catches up with where Brent crude is? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and what's scary about this, Tom, is we're, we're now consuming winter grade gasoline. This is a gasoline that has a higher vapor pressure. It is cheaper to manufacture. And yet prices are at record highs for this time of the year at the pump. I'm afraid now with the situation we're seeing in supplies, crude oil supplies at the NYMEX delivery hub in Oklahoma, we're at very low supplies. There's going to be a tremendous strain on the market already is. We're seeing it now in the front end of the curve, a tremendous amount of premium called the backwardation 
today's price is greater than next month's prices. It's a clear signal that the market is undersupplied. There's too much demand. And again, we'll need prices to go even higher here to even out uh, and bring this market back into wow. equilibrium. Stephen, are you saying this is almost like the opposite of what we saw back in the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. That, that was a situation where you couldn't put any more barrels of crude oil into the delivery hub. And hence, owners had to pay uh, to get that oil out of there. So right now we have a situation where over the past three months, oil inventories at the NYMEX hub have been slashed in half. Now we're only at about 21 million barrels in those tanks. The capacity is closer to 80 million barrels. The problem here, Jonathan, is we're only about two, three million barrels away from what's called tank bottoms. Tank bottoms are is the sludge at the bottom of the tank. So we are now really plumbing the dregs. And that is a concern because there's already issues with regards to the quality of that oil. So if we don't have that quality oil sitting in tank or we're draining whatever is left there, and what we're seeing on the front of the curve, there certainly is an incentive to take even more barrels out of cushion. Then it gets into an issue of quality over quantity, Got and it. we'll have neither. And once again, that's sending a tremendous ripple through the market and helping to support prices and making a case for oil prices going to and above $100 a barrel by, through the end of this month and certainly by the end of this year. So, Stephen, just help me a little bit more to translate some of this stuff. When we saw that data out of Cushing earlier this week and we heard that phrase, operational lows, is that what you just described? Yes, absolutely. So in, in any tank, you can't drain it down all the way to the bottom because there is that, it's called BSW, basic sediment in water. And this is the stuff that kind of floats to the bottom and just sits there. So you have to have a level of oil above that operational levels, the sales line is another way to call it. And, and once we get down to that sales line and we're pushing up against it right now, uh, you're running into an issue is we don't have enough oil sitting in tank right now. Stephen, I look at where we are and you know, all the micro analysis that we do, do we have an energy policy wrapped around the short report, eight pages of distillate, what is New York Harbor, all this romantic oil petroleum stuff do we have an energy policy arching over the short report? Uh, I, I've been trying to search for an energy policy for this country for the past two and a half years. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot right. of confidence in, uh, in the policy that we're seeing. Uh, and as we know, we have a head of the Department of Energy who doesn't even know how much oil we consume on a given day. This is not where their priorities are. So we do not have an energy policy. And therefore, right. uh, you, you've got a tremendous amount of volatility, and it's better to own oil. Uh, we, uh, and look, we, we, we just we, we know what it is. We, we, we're using the SRPR, that is the Strategic Reelection Petroleum Reserve. We've robbed that reserve of 250 million barrels of oil, and yet gasoline prices today are 21 percent higher than when we yeah. started draining the barrels out of there. So, yeah, there is no right. policy when you don't encourage domestic production. You go to Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, you ask them to increase production, and yet we have have what we have right now. So yeah, there is no policy. I think they're making it up as they go along. Stephen, there's one number that contradicts some of that, though, and it's 12.9 million barrels a day of production in America. We're close to all time. Hi, Stephen. How's that happening? How are we having these problems with that happening? Yeah, because it's it's not necessarily about oil. And this is the you know this mistake with taking crude oil out. You and I, we don't put crude oil into our cars. We put gasoline into our cars. We put diesel into our trucks, so forth. So the problem is not necessarily oil per se. It is our ability to refine that oil into what we need. And that's what we don't have. We do not have enough capacity to make enough gasoline, to make enough distillate fuel. So right now, to your point, the industry is doing everything it can right now. 12.9 million barrels with these prices, I'm sure we're gonna go up over 13 million barrels in the weeks ahead. Production, the refineries are running at over 91% capacity. That is at the very seasonal high for this time of the year. And we are churning out an above normal 1.11 gallons of gasoline for every one gallon consumed. So the industry is doing everything it can to get supply to the market. But again, we are strained because demand is outpacing that capacity to make more gasoline, more diesel. So what happens? We have to import it. And of course, when you're importing, yes. you have to pay transportation and that's an extra tax on the, on the yeah. uh, commodity.
Johnny's encyclopedic. Hey, this it's was a just, clinic. It's mind blowing. Hey, this was a great conversation. If you just caught the tail end of it, we'll post that on Bloomberg.com and, of course, on a Bloomberg terminal. Stephen Shork of the Shork Group, live from New York City. Equities up. Good morning. Bond yields are being pinned because the Fed is talking tough at this point and the market realizes that. We were bracing for a higher for longer environment with a higher cost of capital. It's the end of free money and we think it's a good thing. I just wonder whether there's a turning point happening now which isn't visible yet. When you see this kind of volatility, especially in the yields, it's the concentration of risks that will cause something to break. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Down on the week. Down on the month, down on the quarter. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market is positive. It's up on the session by 0.5%. TK, Q4 just around the corner. Q4 around the corner. We're going to see tons of research. It's going to be a massive reading in weekend here as we straighten out Q4 and even the view to 2024. Stop the show. Economist of the week. Ellen Zetner, Morgan Stanley. She nailed the GDP revision, which goes to that uncertainty this morning about, okay, great. What's real GDP going to be? What's nominal GDP going to be? And then what does it mean for the markets? The problem for the recession calls, Tom, for most of this year is the recession, Lisa, that never was. And this bond market move, I think, speaks to that, particularly at the long end over the month so far. So then how can we get inflation back to target? And that really is the angst in the market, especially as you mentioned Bank of America, Brian Moynihan's comments earlier this week, saying there's not going to be a recession. The CFO saying basically the same thing. We're hearing that from companies that are able to start reaccelerating their growth and talk about price pricing power. So at what point do we get the disinflation that usually comes we have from it right slowdown? Now. We have it right now. If, if you we take don't th- get there. If you take three month annualized and not annualized, we are in a dif- dis- there is a vector that screams disinflation. To your point, Lisa, the when of it is a mystery. Do we have the growth slow down? Do we have the slowdown that you'd see reshape in the labor market with claims still around 200K, unemployment south of 4%? But this weekend, within all the reading we do, and folks, we don't compare notes here. We all read different things. How many people are going to come out and reaffirm recession this weekend? I'm guessing not that many. You know what they've been doing, Tom? They've been pushing it out to next year. Yeah. Q1, Q2, back half of 2024. Before we get to Q4, we've got two deadlines to talk about. Government shutdown, deadline looming. That's over the weekend. A little bit later this morning, UAW, Bramo. The good news on that front, if you want to see a deal anytime soon, is that spread, that gap between Detroit's big three, Ford, GM, Stellantis, and UAW is closing. It's closing. The three automakers are somewhere around 20%. UAW were at 40, down to 36, and now we understand here at Bloomberg they're at 30. You'd have to imagine, given that gap at the moment, there's a deal in sight. Julian Emanuel pointed to that as one of the reasons for the rally yesterday that you saw in stocks and one of the rally that you saw in bonds. This question of how much pricing power, how much uh, maneuvering does labor have in terms of power to get higher wages? And if the UAW is going to go all the way down to 30 percent, does that indicate a sort of softening in the stance that can really be broader and actually indicate how much wage increases we could see? So Francisco Linder of the New York Mets, the dreaded New York Mets, that season, good morning, Steve Cohen, season one worked out. He did 30-30. So in the strike, are we going to get 30% raise in 30 hours a week? I mean, that's the kind of I'm stupidity. I'm not sure about the 30 hours right a week now. that's coming, but if, could be the 30-30 if it arrives, I'm very much on board. AMH on those two stories in about 10 minutes' time down in Washington. We'll catch up with her on the UAW strike potential a little bit later this morning, the potential for that to broaden, to deepen, and the looming shutdown deadline over the weekend. Here's your price action going into the weekend this Friday morning. Equities up higher by 0.5%. Equity futures pushing higher as bonds advance as well and yields drop, at least by two or three basis points to about 4.54 on a 10-year. And we have about 90 minutes before we get a data dump that may be one of the last before the government shut down. 8.30 a.m. we get U.S. personal income and spending as well as PCE, that key inflation metric. How much do we see upward revisions to the previous PCE reads? This is what Bloomberg Economics is looking for, even as you do see, as Tom was talking about, the disinflationary push in the actual data for August. 10 a.m. we get the University of Michigan sentiment survey, including the uh, expectations for inflation five 
to 10 years out. In the futures market, you are seeing that kind of inflation over the longer term nice remain chart. sticky. Nice near 2.5%, not that 2% that the Fed is targeting. There is a lack of belief that the Fed right. has the conviction to really inflict the pain to get inflation back down to target. Lisa nails this, folks. When you go out five years and then you guesstimate out five years from there, and that's an amazing chart, Lisa, where it is simply not turned around. And we uh, see yeah. that with the respect of uh, wages continuing to be pressure, which brings us to that 10 a.m. announcement, Facebook Live announcement, UAW uh, giving uh, some, speak, uh, some, some, some points uh, ahead of that 12 noon deadline for a potential strike expansion. So excited for you, Mitch, a little bit later this morning. That's like the highlight. They look, I don't think the they can be, I don't think they can be be. Georgia, but, you know, I think Michigan looks good. I just didn't get the call. I don't think they can. Is it Georgia, Michigan this weekend? No, no, no. Okay. But I was going to no, say, it's going to be like, about? you know, New Year's Eve, Rose Bowl, whatever. Oh, right. Okay. Championship. Okay. I just I don't think Michigan can get it done against Georgia. Georgia, great team. Yeah, every year. More on Combine. our college football analysis a little bit. We won't do that. Mark Hayfley joins us now, CIO of UBS Global Wealth Management. Mark, it's been too long. It's great to catch up, sir. Jumps off the page for me. Something someone actually likes. Energy stocks. Mark, why do you like energy equities right now? Well, we think that they haven't really uh, seen the earnings catch up with these higher prices. You know, Tom has been on fire all morning. He was just asking a lot of people, does the U.S. have an energy policy? I would say I don't know the answer to that, but it sure looks like Saudi Arabia does. And we think that uh, there can be some persistence in these higher oil prices. Uh, you know, Mark, I look at the persistence in oil prices. They got Saudi out to 102 or well. Why is this time at 100 different than the last time at 100? Well, I mean, there, look, there's a couple of factors in in being long the energy names here. One, of course, is geopolitics. Uh, and energy stocks can be a little bit of a hedge on a worsening of, of the crisis. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is the coordination of Saudi Arabia here and, and pushing, frankly, perhaps on the U.S. a little bit into next year's election, which is also a little bit of a geopolitical hedge. So when you, when you step away from the valuations around the energy names, you also have these geopolitical hedges. I, I need to go, to, just because of time, Mark, I want to go to China as well. UBS has a franchise there, back to John Anderson at years ago, where you go beneath the cities, you go beyond it, you go deeper into China. Take us where UBS is right now on China domestic economic stability. Well, I, I think uh, this is something that me and the team are looking at very closely. We are seeing some signs of consumer confidence just starting to return a little bit. Now, the the kind of support for the economy, the stimulus measures probably aren't done, uh, but we're seeing small, some small signs that selectively we want to be overweight in Chinese equities at this point. Mark, can you build on that based on your call for oil and the idea that you could be going long uh, Chinese equities? Is this a call for a reacceleration of the global economy that comes in tandem with inflation? Or is this a call of specific geopolitical pressures and idiosyncratic stories when it comes to China that are kind of independent of global growth reaccelerating? Yeah, I would I would say it differently. We're looking to build a long term robust portfolio with some overweights and some underweights. I think when we look at things here, you know, in the U.S., we see inflation cooling, we see the economy slowing, but this idea that the that a, anything like a recession, you know, is late 2024 at the earliest, and so in that environment, we think that uh, stocks can can do better, and also bonds can do better. I think risk adjusted, we would prefer bonds. Within that equity allocation. That's where we get into some of these selective overweights. I think energy being one, we, we take note that the emerging markets uh, of which China is a part are trading attractively. But I think you know, we would prefer, say, India in a, in a global allocation over China at this point. When you say you're leaning into bonds, you'd prefer bonds. How overweight are you? How much have you been buying over the past couple of days as we've seen yield go to the highest levels going back to 2007? I mean, I think this is a time to, you know, not, we're not trying to be a hero. I think because we see gains uh, on both the bond and the stock side, we're closer to benchmarks in most of the portfolios. But I think that higher grade bonds uh, and, you know, 
tenor of, say, five to 10 years, they should benefit. We should see these yields come down as the growth slows uh, and, and the inflation comes down. That should overpower some of the things I think we saw this week, which had to do with some of the, the sales in the channel. Mark, can we talk about what this bond market move means for specific sectors? And I want to pick out one. I want to talk about the banks. Over the last quarter, we've had a move of more than 70 basis points on a U.S. 10-year. And banks are negative. They're not higher. Mark, can you tell us whether higher rates, high yields help or hurt financials in America? Well, look, we're, you know, the anecdotal evidence uh, over the past six months is that these very rapid moves uh, cause disturbances in the system. So it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just levels. I think it's some concern about the, the rapidity of the moves. Over time, you know, you're going you're going to get different financials able to reprice uh, and the the NII at different rates. So I think you have to look through. But you know, one thing I think the past six months has shown. I think we've lost the last line there. Is Just that left. the super lead banks, the ones where the deposit? Sorry, can you still? It's hear okay, me? Mark. Yeah, you dropped out for a second, but you can jump back in, sir. Oh, Go I'm for it. Sorry, I was saying one thing I think we've seen in the past six months is that it's the super league banks versus the smaller banks in the United States, which have those stickier deposits and maybe have the stronger, more durable business models. Mark, thank you, sir. Sorry about that technical issue. Mark Hayfley there of UBS Global Wealth Management. Appreciate it. That last point, Tom, on the financials. Difficult moment. High yield to uh, hurt the banks this is the number, over the years so far. John, it's the number one thing I'm looking at this weekend is a linkage of commercial real estate, tangible assets into the idea of what the banks do when they bring it in short and lend it out long. And it's the heart of the matter. I look at the Keith Buryat Index, BKX. It's not pretty, technically. I mean, it's just not. Forget about the, the, the big guys pontificating, we're going to have a recession. We're not going to have a recession. Bankers are sweating bullets right now. The stress of spring and struggling to get off the map yeah. for many of these names, Bramo, in a financial sector. And the argument that higher rates help financials, I mean, just look at the screen over the last quarter. That's not been the case at all. Especially because deal flow has just fallen off a cliff. I mean, companies aren't going to refinance or uh, get mergers and acquisitions yeah. together if they do see such volatility. Paul Jews, Citibank, he's out. He's looking at Nike and he's got a neutral on <laughs> Nike. He says Nike is not de risk. Thanks for listening in Brussels, a small town in Belgium. Tadeo over in Brussels says, shut up, Tom. Pharaoh's correct. It's Nike. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that that's how a lot of people in Europe say it. Nike. Which is wrong. Which is wrong. Being here in America, it is Nike, whatever that's worth. Welcome to the program if you are just tuning in. Equities here, positive by 0.5%. Yields a little bit lower by a couple of basis points, 454.86 as we close out the week, as we close out the month, as we close out Q3. We're looking ahead to payrolls next week, Lisa. All of that good stuff to come. We can get our teeth into the data and look ahead to the earnings as well. JP Morgan kick things off on October 13th. Maybe we can get our teeth into the data. Let's be clear. This Possibly. might actually not come through because of the shutdown that a lot of people say is uh, expected. It's hard to know, though, exactly where the balance of risks is right now. It seems like the market, because it's so evenly balanced, is just incredibly volatile to any surprise one way or another. It's not even as if the market okay. has decided. Sur sur survey, last time around 187,000. My first look at the survey is 170,000. Do those numbers get revised like the GDP numbers just got revised? I don't know. They get revised, but the trend, I think, sticks, TK, to see jobless claims. The four-week average, I think it was Neil Dutter over at Renmax said the four-week average now is at February lows on Lisa, what claims. do you think? I mean, what uh, October 6th is jobs day. I didn't even know that, but what do you think? Right now, we're seeing the jobs market remain strong. Here's my question is, do you get this disinflation? Yes, we're seeing it, but do you get enough of it to bring the market into this feeling that the Fed really is going to get inflation back down to 2%? Because right now, that conviction has left, this, has left the building. We need to talk about two deadlines. UAW, a little bit later this morning, shut down risk in Washington <laughs> over the weekend. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in Washington, D.C. is coming up next. Equity futures positive here by 0.5%. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg.
All eyes turn to the U.S. job market. The jobs report, it beckons. It looks like companies are just holding on, holding on, holding on to workers. What you see is what you get. We're seeing a lot of strength. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is exactly what the Fed is looking for. They now believe you can get back to 2% without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expected. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. He should have been there at the first debate. Look, this is, no one is entitled to the nomination of their party. And frankly, Donald Trump continues to campaign as though he were the incumbent president. But but think about this. Uh, he's, he's campaigning as an incumbent, but he has less than 50 percent support of Republicans. That means half of Republicans are looking somewhere else. I, I think he owes it to our party to step forward and answer the questions. Former Vice President Mike Pence speaking to Bloomberg's Joe Matthew and Anne-Marie Horder down in Washington, D.C. Balance of power, 5 p.m. Eastern time, doing a phenomenal job of catching up with presidential candidates over the last month or so. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie in just a moment. If you are just joining us, a couple of deadlines we're looking ahead to. Shut down looming in Washington, D.C., that deadline over the weekend. Later on this morning, we have a Facebook Live event for the UAW president ahead of a noon Eastern deadline for the potential of further strikes. Going into all of that, trying to finish this month, this week, this quarter, in a better place. Your record mark on the S&P 500 positive here by 0.5%. Treasury's actually rallying after selling off Crisis over, over the month, over the quarter. We're back to 455.27 on a 10-year Tom. Yield to lower by a couple well, of basis points. The VIX is 18 level. I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I'm old foggy. I go back and look at the VIX, which is a measurement of volatility, not of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but of the Standard & Poor's 500. 18 level, John, into a glorious 16.60 crisis over. Maybe that's what's percolating here, but of course we can't see it. We said to Julian, if you want to make an equity market call, aren't you essentially making a bond market call? And he said I he think was. That's brilliant. Yeah. And let's review that. He was cautious. We went down to 4,200 ish, and now he's, is, am I right, Lisa? He's reaffirmed 4,600? No, 4,450 by year end. 4,450 by, by year end. Right now we're going to reaffirm interest in Washington and Detroit as well. Amory Horton is our Bloomberg shutdown correspondent. Let's go to the clock right now. The clock is very, very important. Horton demanded that we have a shutdown clock. It's nice that the government shutdown clock dovetails with Jets, Chiefs, and Taylor, they're about the same time. I mean, you know, it works Taylor out. Taylor Swift might be in D.C. this week. Uh, oh, no, New York this weekend, right? Yeah, they may. The Jets, it's, it's 820 Sunday night. Maybe we'll see Taylor get it done pre-shutdown. Amory Horton, we dovetail this morning at 10 a.m. when these two issues cross. What happens at 10 a.m. Yeah. this morning? Well, 10 a.m., we're going to hear Sean Fain with that Facebook Live updating union workers about where they stand with negotiations with the big three. And then potentially we will see an expansion if he's unhappy with those negotiations with the auto giants, an expansion of those strikes. And then also at 10 a.m. here in Washington, D.C., Kevin McCarthy will um, have his news conference and we'll see an update on where they stand in terms of the government shutdown. We did get the text this morning of the continuing resolution, a stopgap funding measure to keep the government funded after the deadline, which now is less than 48 hours. And included in that is something that potentially he can get his Republican caucus to coalesce around. No Democrat is going to sign up for this. 30 percent cut in uh, federal spending. Few like defense, homeland security, veteran affairs will not be included in that. And it goes till October 31st. The issue is, even if Kevin McCarthy can pass this, which that's an if, this is dead on arrival in the Senate. So it does look like it's all, we're heading to a shutdown. John and Lisa want to ask sane, normal questions. Anne Marie, it is absolutely irresponsible to model a 30% reduction in the nominal budget or the inflation adjusted budget. Who is leading that madness? Well, this is the far right of the Republican Party. These are the conservatives who are still upset with Kevin McCarthy. Why for can't his McCarthy debt uh, wait, negotiation. Why can't the gentleman from Bakersfield just say to them, grow up? No. Why can't he do that? Tom, I'm sure he has. And if, have, if you look in some of the reporting of what happened in the meeting the Republicans had 
with uh, amongst themselves, there were some pretty interesting words. Uh, a frequent Bloomberg viewer, Bloomberg surveillance, Bloomberg balance of power, Representative French Hill apparently said to a Matt Gates, which is causing a lot of this. We, I think we call him the flamethrower, one of our stories. He told him to, oh, explicit word, explicit word, off. There is a lot of frustration in the Republican caucus between moderate Republicans and far-right Republicans. I think you know what I mean, and I'm not going to dignify myself with those words on this on this, on this this program. I'm hopeful we can catch up with French on Monday to ask him about that particular comment. Anne-Marie, is this a choice between... He's coming on balance of power today. Well, so. you can ask him oh, then directly. We'll Look forward to that. Yeah, Matt Shirley is this a choice, Anne-Marie, between a shutdown or a new speaker? Does it come down to that? Well, potentially, or potentially we'll have both. So the Washington Post reporting last night that there's this contingent group on the far right that want to oust Speaker McCarthy. The issue is um, we have known that they've potentially wanted to do this. It took him 15 rounds to get the gavel. So this has always been lingering over his head throughout negotiations, whether or not it's this current one about fiscal spending and keeping the government open, or it was the prior debt ceiling negotiation he struck with the Senate and the White House. The issue is, can they coalesce around anyone else? You know, the Washington Post is talking about uh, the whip, Tom Emmer. This is an individual that um, definitely has to hear out the far right of the party. Everyone goes through his, his door, whether it's to be heard or for him to explain to them what is going on and why they need to get on board. They think potentially they have more of a chance of getting through their conservative agenda with him. But if Speaker McCarthy, at the end of the day, has to put forward more of a vanilla, clean resolution that we're seeing take place in the Senate that could potentially mean that you're going to see a motion to vacate. And all of this can happen while the government is shut down. So prepare yourselves for potentially a lot of chaos coming from Washington, D.C. next week. There's been a lot of discussion about immigration policy, and New York City has been pretty vocal on that as well. There's a lot of disagreement within the Democratic Party. Is there anything on that issue in particular coming to the fore that does speak to an actual policy change down the line that you foresee or that you hear as a bipartisan issue? Right now, it's not in terms of a bipartisan issue. What you're seeing in terms of what lawmakers are talking about on the Republican side is they're saying, a lot of them, we don't want any more supplemental aid for Ukraine, especially if we don't have enough funding or provisions in asylum seekers uh, in our legislation. So they, the border has become a huge issue. And what they're trying to do is really put this on the White House. And they're looking to states like New York and talking about the fact that the mayor of New York City, the governor of New York is asking the White House for help. But right now, well, those provisions that are in the, that the Republicans are talking about do not have Democratic support. Just quickly, Congressman French Hill, what time, Anne-Marie, later on this afternoon? Yeah, in the 5 p.m. hour, um, as long as, of course, he doesn't have to cancel in case he's on the floor taking a critical vote to keep our government open, he is set to come on. And given the fact that his frustrations have now eked out into the public press, this is something we're going to want to talk about. Absolutely. Some big questions for him later on this afternoon. <clears throat> Amory, before you go, what was the big takeaway from Vice President Pence in yesterday's interview? The big takeaway for me is that Pence is really trying to distinguish himself against his former running mate and boss, uh, Donald Trump, when it comes to tariffs. He seems very annoyed about this 10 percent tariff wall, basically, that the Trump campaign is talking about that they want to enact. And what you hear from VP Mike Pence is that he says this is going to be a major tax on the middle class. Yes, he was on board for the tariffs with China. He said that he, you know, his team really says that they, that was because China is an adversary. But a 10 percent tariff on everything coming to the United States, he says that is a major killer for the middle class of Americans. And Marie, thanks for the update. Great work, as always. AMH there. On the latest from Washington, the Lumen government shut down and Clearly, Tom, what you're seeing from presidential candidates in the Republican Party trying to draw the former president into some kind of combat, some kind of discussion, debate, and it's just yeah. not happening. Well, you saw that come from former Governor Christie. Look down the barrel of the camera in the debate yeah. and essentially try and get him to come on the stage and join yeah. them. And Bramo, I don't see it happening anytime soon. He's winning by not showing up, so why would he change? Why would he change, precisely? I, I totally agree, Lisa. I mean, why would he change? Tom Emmer, House Whip, legit hockey player, right. University of Alaska Fairbanks, 
in a small school in Boston, Boston College. The real deal. Cool. Coming up, Rabita Faruqi of High Frequency Economics. Equities higher. This is Bloomberg. Getting emotional in the commercial break. <laughs> Two days again on the S&P 500. That's Is that what Fridays are about? Okay. No, I don't want celery. Trying no, to build no, on those gains in the equity celery. market. What are you having? We're bloody, bloody Marys. Marys. You know, after, <laughs> after this September, we're having Bloody Marys. Exactly. We're down on the quarter, mm. on the month, on a week. We're up on a session by 0.4% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up by 0 0.5. Trying to erase some of those losses. In the bond market, the move you'd expect, really. Treasuries rallying, equities rallying in tandem at the moment, and vice versa. On a two-year at the moment, 5.04%. On a two-year, on a 10-year yield, we're down about a basis point to 4.56.29. Came so, so close to 4.70 in yesterday's session on a 10-year maturity. On a 30-year this morning, 4.70.23, Tom. Just pulling back a touch there at the long end. We don't have to talk it now, but what I learned in this September is Mike Wilson cautious, Julian Emanuel less cautious, both are participating in the market. I think that, to me, was a major reaffirmation of what we're doing here. Where you can it's find some cash. common ground, TK, is around the energy story. Yeah. We heard I think that from you, Mark yeah, Hayfley, yeah, UBS, yeah. in the last 30 minutes. Yeah. You heard that as well from... You got to be in the game because you don't know when it's going to go. Mike Wilson, too. You know. I want to finish on the bond market potentially here, climbing for a fourth consecutive week on a 10 year yield. In the FX market, you can make it week 11 potentially on the euro. 11 weeks of euro weakness against that dollar strength. This morning, reclaiming briefly 106 and backing away. 105.95, that currency pair there. Firmer by 0.3%. A little bit of yen strength in the mix as well. Dollar yen breaking back down to 149.18. Under surveillance this morning, less than 48 hours away from a possible government shutdown. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy struggling to get hardline Republicans to approve a short-term continuing resolution to avoid a shutdown. White House staff were told to brace for furloughs and the Treasury said most IRS services would pause. At least we're getting closer, aren't we? One day, 16 hours and about 30 minutes time. Aren't you excited to keep talking about it until then? I can just hear the enthusiasm in your voice. I get to Monday voice. and not talk about exactly. it. That's where I want to be Monday. Well, unfortunately, that's probably not going to happen. And that's what it's looking like because all of these deals don't look like they're actually gaining any traction. The takeaway economically, it depends on how long it goes on. That's what all the notes are saying. So basically another unknown among the sea of unknowns that are leading to a, a wide range of uh, potential outcomes. This is the deadline where maybe we could get some action. We're getting closer, at least. Another deadline looming for the UAW strikers, saying the strike against the big three automakers will expand at noon unless progress is made. Union President Sean Fain expected to give an update on Facebook Live, it's becoming a bit of a weekly tradition at 10 a.m. Eastern time. According to our reporting here at Bloomberg, the workers are ready to accept a 30 per cent pay raise, down from the initial 40 at the start of negotiations, getting closer to the something like 20 per cent that's on offer currently. So that spread is closing, Brammer. Unlike the government shutdown talk, I've got no idea how wide that spread is. At least this one is moving in the right direction. It's a good way to frame it because it does seem like there are changes around the edges. I think Tom nailed it actually earlier when he said we don't know what else is in there. I don't think I would go as far as saying a 30 hour work week, but maybe with respect to uh, certain types of products, mixes of products. The battery EV thing? Well, the key yeah. issue for the um, for the UAW right now is how do they bring in some of those workers, right? How do they actually say to some of the uh, electric vehicle battery manufacturers and I some of the workers in the rank and file, it, it's worth it to come work Can, can I ask us. a dumb question? When do they run out of cars? I mean, I've seen like four articles on this and none of them say like, we don't know, is the mystery. Right? The big question is what cars? So we haven't yeah, seen okay. the big strike at say an F-150 plant. And Bramah, you get the feeling that that's the, the one they've got in the back pocket. They really want to escalate things. They'll go after that. Let's see if that happens. The line in the sand is the F-150. <laughs> right. <laughs> Based on what we've heard right, <laughs> we over the last month, I've been looking forward to talking about this story. I've got to try and read this without smiling. Golf's Ryder Cup underway in Italy. Europe making a perfect start as they look to regain the trophy, sweeping the opening morning of matches to go 4-0 over the US for the first time ever, with the US team failing to hold a lead in any of the opening matches. Europe needs to win 10 and a half of the remaining 24 matches for victory. The afternoon round just getting underway. Brutal start. For America, just outside of Rome, Tom, in I Italy. I witnessed this 1999 Brookline, and I believe it was Greg Norman took my breath away with his power. I'm an amateur on this, folks. So let me tell you, I'm not qualified 
But my two-minute takeaway is this really means something to Europe, and it just doesn't float the boat of the American conscience. Well, let's park the Greg Norman stuff, because that goes back a little bit Way further. Yeah. 1999 Brookline, can you walk us through the atmosphere at 1999 Brookline? A huge Brookline? turnout, but it wasn't that Ryder Club Masters green coat, you know, diplomacy or quietude. Went or out the window. Majesty, out, Went the window. out the window. And then, you know, you come up to the pandemic, I think they're in Wisconsin in 2021, the last time around. And I'm just, 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 I just, do the Americans care about this like the Europeans do? I'm asking. I'm going to ask John a Tom question. Sure. In the UK, how do you sort of view golf, right? In Europe, how do you view there's golf? a view golf in terms Stop. of, I is, know it the the, answer. is it the same kind of no. country club, you know, sort of sense of business meetings go onto the, onto the oh, green? Sure, or is it like a more kind of, you know, the public courses no. that people go out and shoot your races? Son of everything. Go, your son goes to St. Andrews to golf camp. That's, that's, what, what, happens. that's what happens. I, I wasn't cut from that cloth. This is huge in Europe. And I would say this is big yeah. in America for the golf world as well. They don't want to lose to the Europeans. Let's be very clear about that. They do Lisa, not want how, to you, how many people are we going to run into? How many people? You're going to be in aisle seven. I'm going to be in aisle eight of Whole Foods this weekend. Who's talking Ryder Cup? I think it's just like yeah, Masters, but, okay, yes. Hold on a second. But that's also New York City. How many people in general are talking about? I'm just saying. It's not necessarily. You go to good. Bronxville Country Club yes, this correct. weekend, TK. It'll be on the TVs. They care yeah. about this. Okay. Right? And if Bronx Country kill, Club would like to give me a membership it, you while know? we're here, you know, we can have a conversation. That's the latest. I've got no idea what the end result looks like, but it's certainly a very happy, pleasant start for the Europeans we're gonna, over in Italy this morning. We're going to reframe here right now off of the festivities yesterday. Some real debate. I thought Mike McKee was really good on the revisions to your gross domestic product and gross domestic income. We recapitulate with Rubila Faruqi, Chief U.S. Economist, High Frequency Economics. She's Senior Vice President, Revision Math. What did you think of the revisions? Do they indicate a slower American economy? And two-part question, and was it a misguess statistically? Uh, good morning. Uh, I mean, when you look at the revisions, they uh, do tell us, you know, there's more of a uh, more in sync in terms of GDI and GDP. You know, there was a lot of speculation that GDP was going to be revised down quite substantially. We're still seeing positive growth. We're still seeing positive momentum in this economy. What has really uh, stood out to us was the down, uh, downward revision uh, to second quarter uh, spending. You know, our, all our estimates are based on the strong uh, end to the second quarter, and that's ex strength extending into the first uh, month of the third quarter. So, you know, we're waiting to see the breakdown, how much of a down revi downward revision uh, we're going to see in the monthly statistics and what that means for the, the third quarter in terms of growth. Uh, I right. would not be surprised if we actually see downward revisions to those estimates if, you know, if that trajectory is much slower than we were thinking. Carl Weinberg 101 is follow the bond market. Nobody in market economics looks at yield like Carl Weinberg and Rubila Faruqi. This yield September that we've had, how do you fold that into your economic analysis? I mean, a lot of what's happening in the bond market, you know, it really, the higher for longer message, uh, the trajectory of the economy, which was very strong, you know, prior to these revisions, we don't really know what's going to happen. We'll figure that out after 8.30. But, you know, that and that obviously the supply side of uh, what's happening in the bond market. So all of these things fold into that outlook. What happens from this point on, I think that's really, really important because if the growth trajectory is much weaker, that is implications for inflation. That is implications for what the Fed is going to do. That is implications for that higher for longer message. Now, we continue to think that the Fed is at a peak. We also continue to think that the Fed is going to be cutting interest rates next year, not because of, uh, you know, any impending recession, but because uh, of the fact that, you know, we are going to see a more restrictive policy stance as that inflation rate continues to come down. And we continue to see that coming down pretty substantially to a second handle by the second quarter, if not earlier. There are two um, pillars of the economy that people are looking at right now as sort of the tea leaves going forward. One is the jobs market, which seems to be pretty strong. And the other is the consumer and consumer spending. And on the margins, you are starting to see weakness there. What are you seeing there that gives you that conviction that the Fed is at a peak and that we're going to see more material weakness? Uh, we, you know, we've uh, been looking at the job market. We are seeing some slowing from the demand side, some slowing in job growth, some slowing in 
uh, job openings. Uh, this is really about, you know, that pent up demand for, you know, things like travel, entertainment, things people haven't done in three years, right? And and we we've, we've always, uh, you know, subscribed to the, to the view that that demand is not going to go on forever. So I think we are entering that period where, you know, the, those demands for the particular services that the Fed is worried about, travel and entertainment, that that is going to start slowing down more substantially. People are looking at, you know, a backdrop where job growth is slowing, wage growth, growth is slowing. Yes, real disposable incomes are still rising. Yes, job growth is still positive. But there are things like, you know, student loan repayment resumption. You're looking at diminishing cushion for savings. So those things are going to slow down the, that path of spending and growth. It's just that we still don't think that that means recession. We think it's still positive growth, just at a much slower pace, which will bring down inflation. It will also give the Fed some room, uh, you know, in terms of what, what they need to do any further, going further out. How much is the personal income and spending data that we're going to get in about uh, 50 minutes here? I mean, at a certain point, are these data points so volatile and so one-off that you have to look past it and you have to look at series of, say, credit card spends much more uh, aggressively than some of the official data? Um, you know, the, the, the data are subject to a lot of revision, but we, we have nothing better. I mean, I know the high frequency data on credit card spending. Are, we look at it, it's very important, but, you know, at the end of the day, these are the things that feed into GDP. These are the things that we look at. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing is the revisions, obviously, you know, the, the annual the benchmark revisions, that's really important. That's not something we have, we can really do anything about. But what we're seeing right now is growth is still positive. That consumer and that labor market is what's something that we are very focused on. Right now, we don't have any signal. Look at jobless claims, look at positive job growth, look at the unemployment rate. We're not really getting any sense that uh, the U.S. Uh, economy is uh, you know, on the verge about to dip into recession or a contraction or a slowdown that would be concerning. Rabila, thank you. Rabila Faruqi there for High Frequency Economics. Looking ahead to some of that data. Sneak peek of payrolls next week, next Friday. The estimates so far in our survey, 170,000. That's the headline number, down from 187. Rabila mentioned unemployment there. The estimate at the moment, things can change. More estimates come in between now and next week. But at the moment, 3.7% down from 3.8. Toma, three-handle and unemployment, even with the Fed just sitting there. I, North of five. Yeah, we didn't play enough yesterday. I think Lisa nailed it yesterday. Claims four week moving average. You've got to be kidding me. Close to 200K. I, mean, two, I know. Down to 200K. Unreal. If Absolutely you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Your SP 500 positive here by 0.4%. Yields a little bit lower by a couple of basis points, 455.88 on a U.S. 10-year. Coming up at 8.30, the work the city have done off oh, the economics great. desk has been absolutely phenomenal, led by Andrew Hollenhorst and Veronica Clark. Oh, Veronica's going to catch it. up with us at 8.30. Yeah. Well, Team effort, TK. I wonder Team what, effort. Uh, what do they write this weekend, along with everybody else? I mean, do you reaffirm a Fed rate increase? How do you do that in this milieu? They actually just put out a note, so I can tell you kind of what the latest is from their thinking. Oh, they it does have to do out? with they consumer don't consumption. It to me. And there is this feeling that the uh, drivers of this consumption are broadening. Right? We talk about how the economy has been moving on many different cylinders that move at different paces. And right now you are seeing a broadening out, which really does leave the conversation with wages. If people are earning more and they're earning more on a relative basis than inflation's coming in, that turbocharges some of the spending to create a stickier. So they're inflation. suggesting better consumption? They're, uh, they're suggesting that the economy is hotter than many people have expected wow. and that that's going to lead Ooh. to a stronger inflationary pressure and more potential upward moves by the Federal Reserve. Looking for one more hike in November alongside Mike Gapen of Bank of America. Matt Miller writes in on inventory. They have 60 days of inventory on average at these automakers. This is what he said. You're right. Thank you, Matt. The F-150 is the line of the sand. I think everyone understands that at the moment, Tom. So the F-150 is the line of the sand. I've got no idea. Based on the progress we've made over the last week, suggested by our reporting, I wonder whether they'd be willing to cross that line of the sand later on this morning. Seems like a significant escalation to take that step. Especially when it wasn't about... clear whether they Ford were on the naughty step or not with exactly. UAW exactly. at the moment. It seems like a guy down the street escalating. when I was a kid had an Edsel in the garage. Why can't an Edsel be the line in the sand or a AMC Javelin? That we, worked we're going out. back. Are These we? are disastrous okay. cars. The latest on UAW negotiations next.
As many of you know, the Fed's ability to influence the economy depends to some extent on influencing the public's view of current and future economic conditions. One of our goals is to influence spending and investment decisions today and in the months ahead. That will only be the case if people understand generally what we're saying and what it means for their own finances. I have to admit, I've totally forgotten that Chairman Powell has spoken yesterday, speaking at a town hall with teachers in Washington. I think that speaks to the lack of headlines that we actually got from that address from the Federal Reserve Chair. When he has something new to say, I guess he's going to say it regardless of who he's sitting in front of, and right now he doesn't seem to have anything new to say. Your equity market on the S&P 500 got into the weekend. It's doing better over the last couple of days. Two-day winning streak, looking to make it three, up by 0.4% on the S&P. Yields are a little bit lower by a basis point at 4 56, crude a bit higher. We breached 95 briefly yesterday on WTI. We're back down to about 92.79. I didn't know that, really? Even with this move American this morning, oil yeah. hit 95 yesterday. Briefly. I did not know Briefly. That. Back down to about 93 at the moment, TK. Uh, interesting market, interesting Friday, and of course all of us focused on the countdown clock to 10 a.m. this morning where maybe we'll get an adjustment in Michigan. He was, we got a huge response the last time he was on. Joining us now, Patrick Anderson of Michigan, founder, chief executive officer, Anderson Economic Group, but far more than that, arguably the greatest student of how Detroit became Detroit, what Detroit is now, and maybe the hope and prayer of what Detroit will become. Patrick, thanks so much for joining again. We were talking before the segment here on the chaos of the industry, like GM can't build a muscle car, so they had to go to Holden of Australia to build the Pontiac G8 because they didn't have the knowledge to do it in Detroit. How chaotic right now are the manufacturing processes of these auto companies who are being very silent within this strike? They were well running right before the strike. And in fact, you, what you saw with Detroit was low inventories, as you mentioned. They were highly profitable. The only chaotic portion was the big investment in EVs, where both right. Ford and General Motors were losing two or three or four billion per year, which works out in some cases to fifty thousand dollars a copy for an electric vehicle. That was really the only difficulty right. going on in Detroit before the strike. If they are profitable, why can't they give some of that to their valued labor? They absolutely can. And if you look at, at the Anderson Economic Group uh, preview of this, we said that these auto workers, like everyone else, were suffering from inflation. They didn't create the inflation. You have to expect that they're going to get wage increases. And in fact, that's what the automakers have offered. The sticking point, and I, I wouldn't call it just a sticking point because it's, it's more than a point, is that the UAW demands now are for far more than wage increases. Uh, they include things that represent actually bankruptcy risk for the automakers, such as a return to the notorious jobs bank and having a defined benefit pension, which were two of the things that led to GM and Chrysler's bankruptcy a decade ago. In the meantime, what is the ripple effect of what we've seen from the strikes? I know you're an organization and you've been doing incredible work trying to quantify it. Where are we? First week cost was $1.6 billion, and those were 1.6 hard numbers lost, most of which was wages. And a fraction of that was the automakers. A lot of it were UAW, and a lot of it were non-UAW suppliers. The second week estimate, we're going to have that on Monday, but I can tell you it's going to be bigger than $1.6 billion because strikes become more expensive over time, not less expensive. And in particular, what happened in the first week is you can expect some inventory to basically just be sopped up. And pretty much everyone in the industry, dealers, suppliers, manufacturers, anticipated some kind of strike uh, for at least one automaker. So they were ready for a few days. Uh, were they ready for two weeks, three weeks? Were they ready for Sean Fain? The answer to that is no, they were not ready for the kind of... Uh, disciplined, focused strategy that the UAW president has brought forward. That's not to say the demands are reasonable, but clearly the leader of this is not the big three, it's the president of the UAW. 
They do have inventory uh, still, and so there is a question about whether this will actually lead to higher priced cars. Do you have a sense of how quickly that inventory is coming down? At what point this does raise costs in the near term on auto purchases? I don't have a question about that anymore. Uh, we pointed out before the strike that the, uh, the inventory in the industry was about a quarter this time what it was in 2019. So inventory is much smaller. Uh, and in fact, what you've got is higher prices already. So if anything, right. prices have, had moderated a little bit before the, before the strike. And here, the UAW strategy, which is surprising, but again, Sean Fain and the UAW are really leading setting the terms of this, include hitting parts uh, facilities and strategically picking assembly plants. So they are starting to affect prices. Right. I think this is something to look for in week, in week three. And one of the things to look is what is going to be announced today? Are we going to stay with the plants that we have, assembly plants? Uh, you mentioned earlier the F-150. Uh, right now, Ford's assembly has, hasn't been hit very much. We estimate that we lost 25,000 production units in the first 10 days, almost all of which were profitable vehicles that would have been sold. So they've lost a lot of production already, and they're going to lose more. Patrick, we don't have time for a Patrick Anderson 45-minute dissertation on where American auto manufacturing is heading. But in the time we have, we're moving to things that have fewer parts, EV vehicles that are simpler made. On a unit basis, on some form of Anderson productivity basis, does everybody understand there's just going to be fewer warm bodies making these things? This is a subtext of this particular uh, bargaining session. It's the wild card out there. Uh, it, un, until just recently, it wasn't even mentioned except kind of in hushed tones and in, in the second or third 10-minute uh, session of an investor call. But a big issue in this is, are we going to continue as taxpayers to subsidize uh, plants that are producing vehicles that require fewer labor hours at wages that are less in plants that are in many cases joint ventures with uh, Chinese companies or South Korean companies or other companies and actually substitute that for profitable vehicles that consumers want. That's something we outlined before the strike is a serious issue and that is at this point completely unresolved. Have you got an answer to that? What is your base case at the moment, Patrick? If you just had to take a guess, what would it be? I don't know what is going to happen. And the, the fact that President Biden came to the assembly line and said, yeah, well, they should get at least a 40 percent increase uh, and then said nothing about whether we were going to continue as taxpayers to subsidize the battery plants and actually pay for the conversion. And that's actually the word that the Department of Energy uses. We pay for conversion of plants that are making vehicles that are now being sold profitably to electric vehicles that are growing, but growing very slowly. There's not a base case out here that works. And being sold to a high-end consumer as well currently, Patrick, does that complicate the effort? Absolutely. I, I, I've got a battery electric vehicle out in my garage, uh, but fortunately I have another car I can drive. Uh, and the fact is that 72%, that, uh, according to our Anderson Economic Group assessment of these electric vehicles are luxury cars which is perfectly fine. But uh, when you have government policy and taxpayer money and contracts and internal subsidies and regulations that are pushing for 40 or 50 or 60 percent of the vehicles to be those that are primarily favored by wealthier people in metropolitan areas, we have a serious problem both as an industry and as a society. And that is an unresolved issue for which there is no base case for success. Patrick, it was wonderful Just, to get your insight. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Patrick Anderson of Anderson Economic Group on some of the tensions out there, Tom, on current policy. They're huge tensions. And, you know, he's one of these think tank guys. He's a claim. He walks around and he's not looking at like the news flow to 10 a.m. He's looking at where are we 10 years out. And I, you know, John, you've led on this, frankly. And help me, Lisa, just on the chemistry of batteries, not some fancy physics, thermodynamics things. On the chemistry of batteries, are we even in the game versus the Chinese? To that point, Matt Miller just writing in again. 
who What's I'm going to always turn to internally to, to get my advice on this particular subject. Yeah. He said the Chinese are hoping we flinch on EV production. Their fingers crossed the union stop US investment in battery production. The Chinese in many ways in certain circumstances leading on this effort. That's the latest on Michigan. A whole lot more a little bit later. Equity futures on the S&P 500 higher from New York City. This is Bloomberg. It takes a long time for the Fed's actions to work through. Markets are very impatient. We see slowing quite evident here, but not surprising. But yet we don't see the economy falling off a cliff. Fed should be able to be cutting rates sometime in 2024. The market's going to feel that out. And when it does, we think equities are going to rip again. The big risk to me is people just sit in cash and you miss the end of the cycle and the beginning of the next. Right. What the market is losing sight of maybe is that there is going to be a recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, on a Friday to read into the weekend, October, and maybe even read into 2024. We survived the week, a little bit of a breath of fresh air, crisis over today, VIX 16.75. But, John, globally, the tension's still there. Just about survived the quarter. Tom, we've got to sit on this quarter. The third quarter in the United States, the Treasury market, yields higher by more than 70 basis points. Tom, that is a monster, monster move. And I'll give one shout out to one guy in particular, Krishna Mamani of Lafayette, who at the start of the year said he thinks the pain trade is higher equities. Halfway through the year, he said he thinks the new pain trade is higher yields. Higher yields and much, much higher yields has been the story over the last couple of months. Well, the pain trader, let's start with equities here. And, the, you know, the suppleness of Julian Emanuel leading us off today, getting cautious, and now he's getting a little more optimistic as well. But, I mean, Lisa, just plain and simple, are bonds and stocks correlated helping? Well, they have been, but in the wrong way. I mean, they had been diversifiers, right? Now the 60-40 either gets amplified during rallies or uh, duly punished, uh, magnified way uh, on the way down. This is going to be a concern going forward because where do you diversify? And we heard this earlier this week. What if it's the dollar? What if the dollar sort of we saw that emerge as the diversifier in a world where bonds and stocks are trading yeah, in tandem? I, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. But what I'm going to take is every conversation, whatever anybody's belief is, we're data dependent. John, we got a Seattle slew of data today. We've got wholesale inventories, personal income spending. I guess that's important. PCE deflator, Chairman Powell says that's important. And then we've got Michigan over Georgia, Michigan sentiment. Ex the, the, the five to 10 year inflation call of University of Michigan. You met, yeah. That's wait. a hell of a crystal ball right there. All a little right. bit later. Okay. A little bit later. <laughs> Jobless claims, 200,000. Unemployment still with a three handle. This year so far, the recession that never was. The recession that never <clears> was. And now we're talking about headwinds for the consumer going into Q4. There's a long list of them. I'll give you three. Higher rates higher energy prices, student loan repayments, resuming TK, and there's a whole lot more out there as well. Can we stand up to the latest negative story for 2023? And yet, correct me, in this hour, Citigroup, and Lisa, you said Citigroup says that there is some form of better consumer out there pushing against what John just said? There's a broadening out. It's not just being driven by a couple of different sectors. You're actually seeing a reacceleration in certain durable goods or certain uh, just items, physical items rather than services. Here's my question. Take the UAW as a preeminent example in the conversation that we just had. They are feeling the inflationary pressures. They are demanding wage increases along with other things. You are seeing an increasing amount of labor pushback. Does that in and of itself drive an yeah. additional consumer push because they do have the additional income coming in from their wages, not from stimulus payments and not from savings? Okay, so we get beyond, yeah, we stagger into October. I haven't figured out what to go as for Halloween, you know, yet. I'll, I'll figure that. I think I'm going as Gamma. Gamma? I think I'll go as Gamma what this year. What about a barrel of oil, TK? No, that was, that was a couple of years ago. That was last Bramo year's story. Did that. She, had the, okay. she had the offspring going on the street. One was Brent, one was WT. I'm going as Gamma this year. Okay, we got to stagger through October. I believe there's a Fed meeting out there somewhere. They're all going to wear Halloween costumes at the meeting. What data are they going to have? Jobs, inflation. Maybe. Any more? <laughs> Can we explain why Lisa's throwing out a maybe? <laughs> that if you get the government shut down, you don't get the jobs data. Which puts yeah. even more emphasis on the earnings that you might get a little bit later in October. So we should maybe look ahead to earnings. JP Morgan, middle of October, Tom. Based on what we heard from I, Bank of America, yes. 
over the last week from the CEO and the CFO who are basically saying no recession. How can you have one when consumer spending is up 4% year over year? That's some pretty strong, powerful pushback from Brian Moynihan and company, Tom, over at Bank of America. Well, yeah, and it's Brian Moynihan listening to Michael Gapin. This is one of the big things. Moynihan always goes back and cites his economic prism. And one thing I'll say, and this came up a couple times this week. I mean, Lisa, help me here because we heard it three, four times. People are looking at what we're doing with our charge cards, what we're doing with our auto loans. And I, basically... If it's going up, it's a spike. And if it's going down, it's a cliff, right? Well, people are borrowing more. And that's one warning sign that people are looking at is that, yes, they are spending, but credit card uh, outstanding debt is going up significantly. So this is one thing to watch in the soup of uncertainty soup, that we have tax. percolating Brilliant. out of the data factories. My data to start, John, is a VIX, under 18, under 17, a more benevolent 16.64. The data factories. Don't, what are on. you on about? <laughs> Let me get away with that. You can have that Give one. Give us some more. All right, all right, whatever. It's almost the weekend. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Equity futures on the S&P. You're killing me. Up 0.4%. Bramo's feeling kind if she's saying soup and not brute, right? It's true. You know, like the soup of uncertainty <laughs> instead of the toxic brew. Toxic brew is bad. Okay. Soup is good. Good, good, good. Equity's up by 0.4% on the S&P. Yields a little bit lower by a couple of basis points. Quite a range in the last 24 hours. 468 down to about 455 currently. 455.27 on a 10-year. Quite a range for the euro as well. Had a look at 104. Had a look at 106. It's back down to about 105.90. That currency pair firmer by 0.3%. And crude briefly intraday and yesterday's session, 95 on WTI. WTI right now, TK, 93. We're positive by 1.4%. We are going to digress right now. And on a Friday, and this is absolutely perfect at the end of Q3. What about the advisors out there? What about the advice you're getting as you recalibrate into the fourth quarter and indeed into 2024? Dana Dioria is co-CIO and group president in Envisnet Solutions, and they are in the absolute crux of how diversified to be diversified within your financial instruments. Dana, welcome to the show. Thrilled to have you on. Help me here with 6040. I mean, what, what are advisors doing as they calibrate 6040 forward? I think advisors this year are thrilled about 60-40 because it finally has some yield on the 40. So notwithstanding 100%, we're getting um, not the nice diversification benefit that we would like in the short run uh, coming, you know, obviously yields increasing dramatically. Um, and, you know, we, we, of course, also experiencing, at least through September, obviously getting a little bit better the last couple of days, but, um, you know, a tough September for stocks. Right. But that's kind of short run stuff, right? Um, you know, when you're when you're an advisor and the, the business that you have for these clients, that 60-40 this year with the yield that you're able to get, it's still, you know, re reflecting back on what we've been through the last several years right. where there was no we had, they're pretty happy with the 60-40 again as it, as it compares. You know, I, I look at what bonds have done and like an advisor, I've gone to the biggest blended fund, which is the Vanguard Total Market Bond Fund. And I really didn't understand the carnage, folks. If you go back 30 years, and Dana knows is cold, you've got the great moderation, and up you go. And I'm sorry, Dana, we're off a cliff, and BND has just gone through to new lows as well. When do I see bonds get a bid? Yeah, so I don't know that it's that surprising what's happening in the bond market, right? I mean, if you look at the fact that we're what, what the um, yield curve inversion has been and what we're seeing inflation, you know, as well as the fact that the stock market now for the past year has been pricing in, hey, look, this is going to be a soft landing. We're not looking at recession here. So perk off, right? So, I mean, it, it's not it's not shocking to me that 10-year um, yields are, are finally kind of increasing and instead – you know, we're seeing um, that markets now are, which which have been doing great, stock markets, excuse me, which have been doing great and pricing in this great growth already, the 10 years now appear to be, you know, catching, um, it, are saying, well, oh, maybe, maybe it was a little much. So, you know, there's turbulence how these markets come together. But is it really that surprising where 10 years are, given where two years are? Given um, you know all all the economists, the newly minted bulls that we've had we've had in the last few months, um, even the Fed itself saying, "Hey, we think we're going to stick the landing. There's no recession here." 
Dana, I'm curious about the sentiment in your clients. At a time when we've seen a sell-off, at a time where 6040 has been very punished, heavily punished over the past couple of months, how much are people running versus saying this is a great buying opportunity? Every dip has been buyable. Let's go. I think, you know, for the most part, advisors on the platform are not super tactical, right? So they're going to look at the, the allocation of the client and say, okay, what's the long haul, right? They're going to rebalance. I mean, I think the big thing for a lot of advisors is, am I rebalancing back to, you know, the risk tolerance of the client? It's not so much, hey, do I see an opportunity here to take my client assets and, you know, buy in? It's really more about, okay, am I positioning the clients to, you know, for the potential that recession still comes, for the potential that we haven't hit market bottom, or am I letting that allocation get a little bit more equity, a little bit uh, riskier, which which will happen, right, in a market where um, stocks, at least for the first half of the year, were doing phenomenally well um, and, you know, kind of outpacing. So I think for advisors, it's about saying, what's the overall posture of the client? Am I prepping them well? You know, the advice I give a lot is, look, I, I, I'll, I'll grant you, there's a lot to be happy about with this economy. We're nowhere near what we thought we would be second half of this year, right? If you if you talk to people the first half of the year, um, everybody was like, prepare, you know, prepare yourselves. Uh, some of the economists, we, we get a lot of information from a lot of different places, a lot of asset managers on the platform, a lot of research services. Some of them are just pushing that call out. They're saying, look, it's going to happen. You just, you know, wait for 2024. Um, some aren't. But but what I would say is for, for the sake of advisors, it's really kind of about, well, am I positioned well in case of a potential problem, right? Because we all know people fear their losses a lot more than they feel their gains. It's the three-month rolling recession call of the last 12 months, Dana, hasn't it, TK? It's been a story the last year. Yeah. It's sort of happening just sort of three months out and continuously yeah. three months out. Dana, thank you for joining us. Dana Dioria there of Investnet. That bond market, equity market move, Tom, has been painful. Equities down, right. bonds down. That's been painful. That is a snapshot into what advisors, well-meaning advisors, are trying to do within diversification, and they're overwhelmed by, wait, why don't we own Apple? I mean, that's the heart of the matter. Should we own Microsoft? At the other heart of the matter, Tom, when you sit down in front of these kind of individuals, they'll tell you 60-40. They'll say you want an allocation to bonds, Lisa, an allocation 60% to 60% Apple, 40% Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they'll walk you through, Bram, as to why you should do that. And ultimately, it just hasn't worked. History has broken this year. And I think that how do they readjust, like given the fact that there is a new paradigm, at least for now, and it could potentially continue. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Equities here trying to do something, trying to bounce over the last couple of days, adding to that move, the S&P up by 0.5%. Yields coming in a little bit as well. That correlation we've been talking about, it sticks. It's Treasuries rally and equities rally and yields lower by two or three basis points to 454.65. Veronica Clark of City coming up in about 15, 16, 17 minutes. Look out for that conversation as they look for another rate hike from the Federal Reserve in November and looking out to 2024 for potentially a reacceleration <coughs> in inflation as well. And on the politics, Mohamed Yudis of Gallup on the looming government shut down. Always a fantastic guest, Tom, just to gauge where yeah. public opinion is and, lying and where it's shifting to. In the, within the arc of Gallup, which goes way past Harry Truman, back decades and decades, this is an, it's almost like we're honored to have him on to give us some actual polling substance versus the frenzy. Well, how is this being received, right? I mean, we talk about whether we're going to get a shutdown, whether we're not going to sh get a shutdown. We hate talking about it. Everyone hates listening to us talk about it. Everyone's sick of this topic. And yet here we are with 800,000 people who might not be paid starting on Monday. So there's a real question here about how this is going to pull how many people? in the general. I believe it's 800,000 government well, workers that you. are susceptible to that. that. Amazing. That. But the congressman... They Congress still women they, they, still yeah. get paid. Yes, they still so get paid. So does Biden get yeah. out there with the the the, I, the, the, you know, the back megaphone in the Eurozone the debt crisis? I remember making a point, and I wasn't alone to make this, that they should have all been paid in their sovereign debt. I and love they might that have sorted point. out a little bit more quickly. The fact they still get paid but can shut down the government is just remarkable to me. From New York, this is Bloomberg. <laughs> is we're going to have 10-year rates at least at 5% or higher um, because of this embedded inflation. This structural inflation is unlike anything. And, and I think business leaders and politicians are not providing 
uh, the foundation to help explain this. We have not seen inflation like this in over 30 years. Brilliant exchange there between Larry Fink, the BlackRock chair and CEO, and Danny Berger. Catch Danny Berger with Manus Cranny. On Bloomberg, the brief takes place at about 5 a.m. Eastern time, if you're up early for that one. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, positive by 0.5%, a lift here in the equity market. Yields a little bit lower by three basis points, 10-year, 54.45 on a 10-year at the moment. The Euro's had quite a ride this week, still poised for an 11th week of weakness on the Euro against this strong and powerful dollar. 105.97, Tom, on the Euro against yeah, the US dollar. Triangulated Euro-Yen is where I've got to go. 158.13 is pretty much stasis. It's been a combined effort. Euro and yen both weak against a resilient dollar. BOJ move overnight has been quite interesting to see, Tom. Seemingly based on actions alone, based on actions, just a pure observation, seemingly more concerned about that move in yields moving yeah. too quickly than they are by but levels right now on dollar yen, is about 149. Multiple interventions doesn't work. I mean, is am I right that yen's supposed to be 147 now? Oops, it's not. Well, they're two opposing forces, and that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Ultimately, if you want to get some support for the currency, you've got to allow yields to come up a little bit more relative to what you're seeing yeah. elsewhere. I think first week of November, it says team surveillance, Tokyo. Tokyo? You know, I, I, I I'm not sure the time. The Imperial Hotel. The time can, difference works. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright's hotel. We can be there in the, 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 the one of the few original parts of the hotel left uh, from the Frank Lloyd Wright era is the bar. So we could, you know, it's a little <laughs> dark and gloomy. Okay. We'd have to. Steve would have to bring in some extra lights. We could do a Japanese thing. All right. It, uh, Bramo good. hasn't mentioned anything, so I'm not sure she's on board for, for, what, for what that's worth. <laughs> Broadcasting from Bramo's Japan very silent. Nope. <laughs> carry on. No thanks. <laughs> right, let's carry on. Right now is a really important conversation. And this remembers in my ute, I can remember my grandfather talking about in 1936, oops, FDR won. He beat Elf Landon, and no one except George Gallup nailed that. The tradition continues forward with careful polling of America. Mohammed Yunus, editor-in-chief of Gallup this morning on our distrust of Washington. The 17% reality for you, Mohammed, is our popularity of our vaunted Congress people. It's never been that low, has it? Um, it's sat around that low before, but it's really, we're at rock bottom basically now. 17% of people approve of the job Congress is doing. Those data were being collected really as this shutdown uh, sped up. But, you know, Lisa mentioned history uh, has been broken. Sadly, in this part of our conversation, history is repeating itself. We've had 10 major shutdowns since Reagan, the longest under Clinton, Obama, and uh, Trump. So it's not, there's not a lot new here. One of the things people really are expressing in our poll, though, is this question of what is the most important problem facing the country? The most frequent response is poor government and poor leadership. But when you add up all of the issues that Congress is primarily responsible for, it shoots up to 40 percent. So 40 percent of people in the country are mentioning a major role of Congress as the most important problem facing us today. So, Mohammed, how do you put this together? Yes, this is history rhyming. But on another level, if people don't like it, why do they keep voting for the same Congress members? Well, what's fascinating, Lisa, is people are much more positive on their own Congress representative than they are at the body at large. There is a little bit of a partisanship, 22 percent, so slightly higher Democrat. Republicans are at 9 percent approval um, of Congress. You know, this just keeps getting worse and worse. When we ask, for example, about the ability, trust and confidence in Congress to solve domestic problems, 56 percent of Americans say they have no trust in this Congress to do so. So, Mohammed, how do you understand the accuracy of polls that have been uh, of perhaps spotty reliability in the past number of years? I'm wondering what you glean from this idea, this divergence of overall perception versus the tangible, will you vote for this one person? I mean, are polls getting less accurate in terms of truly measuring who people want and what they really are paying attention to? I'm so happy you asked this, Lisa. Actually, they're not. It depends on what polls you talk about. A lot of the missed polls or the polls that have been off really have been at the state level. But when you do a responsible representative phone poll, despite the low response rates in this country on national issues and certainly on who do you plan to vote for, they tend to remain very accurate. You know, Tom mentioned 
um, our history of forecasting elections. We don't do that anymore, but we still test the methodology of our polls basically by asking those questions. And we find them to continue to be uh, very prescient on right. where people are voting. Mohammed, uh, William Jennings Bryan died before the advent of what George Gallup did. And some people would say his movement died with him. Tell us about the Trump movement. Tell us about what Gallup studies about a Republican Party, the GOP of grievance. Does it have legs out years? Yes, it does. And the grievance far predates Trump. Uh, the grievances also, Tom, not just Republicans. One of the really interesting things about President Trump is that early on in his presidential campaign, a lot of Democrats were showing up to his rally. Many of the things that he speaks to and that people like Bernie Sanders speak to are primarily a popular view in this country, as, as you saw with the numbers that we just mentioned. Perceptions of corruption are really high in the United States. Trusted national institutions are at an anemic low, and that goes from the Supreme Court to Congress to the FBI, pretty much across the board. So the grievances are there, and they will most likely far outpace President Trump's um, uh, right. uh, history and maybe even lifetime. This now, and I know you don't do the presidential ballet anymore, but now, who is the American silent majority? That's such a tough question to answer. I think... Uh, one way I would answer that question is the American silent majority are people who see themselves working far harder in their own lives than their elected leaders are working to solve the problems facing the country. So candidates who speak to those frustrations will have the most powerful messages um, presented. The other thing that's huge that's happening, Tom, is Republicans are very down on big government. And we see that all over our polls. One of the biggest partisan splits in this country is the perception that federal government has too much power. There's a 51 percent difference between Democrats and Republicans. So Republicans who speak to that issue will absolutely uh, have a lot more clapping going on for them than those that brush across it and focus on other topics. Mohammed, you said that polls have been uh, more accurate or the same accuracy as they have been in the past. What do you make of this poll by the ABC News and Washington Post uh, outlets that showed p former President Trump up by nine percentage points in a matchup between him and President Biden? It's funny you mentioned that poll because it's gotten a lot of criticism. Um, I think even though polls are accurate, it's really important to see all of the data that's out there. So what we do is look at a poll like that, and we look at other polls that use similar methodology. And where a poll is an outlier, that's a serious reason for concern. That poll actually tended to be an outlier compared to a lot of other similarly situated methodology polls that ask that question. So I would take that poll with a grain of salt, um, and time will tell. But certainly President Trump's staying power is there, uh, whether he's in the debate or not. People are still seeing him as essentially the front runner for the Republican Party. At the moment, doesn't seem to need to attend the debate at all. Mohammed, thank you. Mohammed Yunus there of Gallup, always fantastic on some of these issues. Looking ahead on the open about 35 minutes from now, Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein Advisors, Sabaj Rajapra of SockGen on this bond market, Kate Moore of BlackRock on what on earth to do with equities going into Q4. And a little bit later on this weekend, thank you very much for the tremendous feedback over the last week to the conversation with Daniel Levy, the Tottenham chairman. We'll be playing that out over the weekend, oh. Saturday, Sunday, 1.30 Eastern Time. Saturday 1.30, so, you know, you'll be at Tots Liverpool while the Daniel Levy interview's playing. Is that right? What time yeah. is that game taking it's, it's place? It's about dovetails about right. I can't do the time change in my head. <laughs> Are we competing with the programming perfect, on NBC? You know, is that you, what's happening? No, you, you, yeah, we're competing, but it's a hell of an interview. <laughs> and, you know, you're so affiliated now with English football, I think Liverpool gave you some tickets and Tots Liverpool this what are weekend. You, what are you suggesting? That I'm going back to the I'm UK again this weekend. I'm suggesting that you should do more on English football, is what I'm suggesting. I'm, I'm, you know. The effort is gearing up. If that's what you'd like to see. Well, I'd like to see okay. it. You know, I'd, you know, I'd like to. And some people would like us to talk you know. about it less here, so maybe we can figure that out as well. Could you figure out if James Madison can play this weekend? Come on. Great signing this summer, hey? Yeah. Fantastic transfer, okay. so far at least. Futures up. This day. is Bloomberg.
Quick surveillance, Jonathan Farrow on assignment, Lisa Abramowitz here in Tom Keen. Lisa, a ton of data today. Yeah, and really important to understand where the consumer is, considering that this is one of the big mysteries. How long can the consumer keep spending at a time where their savings are ostensibly shrinking? They were supposed to go away. They still right. are here, so, you know, here off we are. Off pandemic, off Fed, and now we're restrictive, accommodative, whatever. It's like a pivot point. Is it pivot point October? Well, and perhaps the PCE deflator, which is one of the key indicators for the Fed will show right. uh, some of that good news that people yeah. are looking for. The data wanders out here this morning. A lot of granularity here and important data to gauge GDP. Our Michael McKee, our chief shutdown reporter, joins us now. <laughs> We've got more to say about that later, too. All right, let's go right to it. The PCE deflator, month over month, up four-tenths. That's double what we saw last month, a two-tenths rise, but less than anticipated. On a year-over-year -year basis, we're at three and a half percent. That's up from 3.3 percent. The core, though, only up a tenth of a percent half of what was uh, seen in July. Now, remember, these are August numbers. Uh, and um, we're also getting, and I'll get back to this in just a second, we're getting revisions because yesterday they revised GDP, so that affects these, uh, these PCE numbers. The core deflator, as I said, up a tenth of a percent. On a year-over-year -year basis, up 3.9 percent. The prior month was revised up to 4.3. Uh, and so, it's a bigger drop, even though um, the prior month was revised up. So at this point, uh, some progress from the Fed. The uh, the headline number, 3.4 percent in July, down to three, uh, or up to 3.5 percent rather in August. Other numbers out just now: uh, the trade balance, 84.3 billion dollars. That is down from 90.9. That will add to third quarter growth somewhat. Right. Inventories down a tenth of a percent. They had been down at two tenths uh, percent in July. And uh, retail inventories up 1.1 right. percent after a half a percent. So all those uh, numbers uh, there will be something well, that get factored into a maybe higher GDP number. Uh, the market move in that observation Why Mike d dives further into this data. Uh, the market likes what it sees. Futures up 28. Dow futures up 186. The VIX comes in a stick right now, 16.3 at one in the yield space, a 10 year yield comes in now four basis points, 4.54 percent. Lisa, while Mike was warbling gaily, I did a log triangulation of the last 10 days of the 10 year yield, and the critical point is 4.51 percent. Lisa, we're not there yet, 4.55 percent. I'm glad you go to the technical aspect of this because this feels like technical moves on the periphery of yeah. data that doesn't really offer us really conclusive uh, kinds of messages. Right now, what I see that stands out to me is that this is your soft landing, beautiful scenario where basically consumers are still spending, albeit on a slower pace, and you are seeing on the margins disinflation, albeit also not at that fast of a pace. Right. Is this enough to get the Fed back down to 2 percent? The market on the margins is feeling a little more comfortable. Uh, the 10 year real yield 2.17 percent and again three standard deviations of the bond turmoil in yield that we've seen is a 4.50 percent really almost out to four decimal points so we're not there but we've broken down nicely under two standard deviations to a lower yield. Mike two more observations go. Well, uh, spending and in incomes are both up four tenths for the month. As we noted, uh, the spending numbers down from a nine tenths gain in July, so cooled off a little bit. That would uh, take something away, maybe, from GDP. But according to the government, it's mostly uh, spending on gasoline. Uh, is the the biggest category as gas prices went up. The biggest category for the current personal income rise is uh, compensation. So people making more money uh, than they had been making, which you'd see as a good thing. Personal savings rate comes in at 3.9%, uh, which is oh, okay. uh, down a little bit uh, from the prior month. But uh, it, sh it fits into the narration of do we see people trying to, uh, at this point, uh, spend their savings to keep up their spending. Yeah. That's a Just low quickly, number. we're looking right now at these data points that are going to have to be included in a series that then are mapped out over time so the Fed can come to some sort of uh, projection. Are we going to get the next point in the series? Are we going to get that jobs report? Well, the jobs, uh, we, we will find out probably today uh, as a matter of just uh, practical timing, it looks like something will have to shut down on Monday because they can't 
just legislatively get things through Congress, even if they made an agreement today. And if so, uh, it takes a couple days to get everybody back to work and get back uh, on track. So it's not clear about whether next Friday we would get the jobs report or not. Obviously, if we go into the beginning of next week, uh, past Monday, you would not get the jobs report. The more worrisome thing is, would you not get the uh, CPI and PCE reports because the Fed is very concerned about And when about are they? They're like a week later, right? Uh, the the uh, CPI, yeah. I believe, is the 14th, maybe, yeah, okay. and, uh, and PCE so, comes out the 27th of September. Nick, quickly here, next Friday, you fly, you take your junket down to Washington, you or go not. to the Bureau of Labor, <laughs> and there's no one there? Yeah, um, we'll have pictures of me knocking on the door. Uh, no, they, okay. they, 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 that's I mean, a reality. There will be there will be people working there, but not the people who release okay. the data, and all of them are not getting paid. We should mention too that um, if this shutdown goes into next week, Fat Bear Week will not take place. The uh, the government uh, the the park rangers up in Alaska can't run the Fat Bear cams. Uh, so oh, the grizz cams, bear cams. The fat, the, it's Fat yeah. Bear Week where they pick where you get to vote on the fattest bear uh, as they get okay. ready for hibernation, and this is a, I mean, a, a huge okay. deal on the internet. So. We'll have to look that up. Michael McKee with news you can use from Alaska. Thank you so much, our chief shutdown correspondent. They have led the way to this higher rate regime that we are living. Veronica Clark with Andrew Hollenhorst leads from Citigroup. What are you writing this weekend, Veronica? Cut to the chase. We need a surveillance out front look. What are you going to publish for Monday? Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of data. Of course, this week we had GDP revisions yesterday, all the, the spending and inflation data today. Um, overall, it doesn't really change the, the picture that much. I mean, growth seems pretty resilient. Yeah, we've had some slowing in inflation, but we did get revisions higher. We're coming from a, a higher rate. Um, there's really not that much to change a, a pretty solid growth backdrop, inflation that's still high, You know, really not much to change the message from the Fed, which we heard last Wednesday is higher for longer. And so I think that's that's the outlook. Veronica, when you take a look at credit card spending, a number of people are saying anecdotally you are seeing a significant uh, decrease in activity, that people are being a, a little bit more frugal and uh, a little bit more discretionary with their income. How much do you reject that in your thesis that you're seeing almost a reacceleration in certain areas that could fuel inflation? Yeah, we've absolutely seen that in, in good spending. You know, a lot of the story of the last couple of years has been you know, people were shifting spending away from goods and back towards services, you know, as things were reopening. But the last couple of months, you know, we've absolutely seen retail sales spending. You know, that's on, on goods tick up. We've seen strong, durable goods orders. Um, so it's not, you know, entirely that, that people are shifting their, you know, slowing spending. It's maybe that you know, things are shifting relative to the patterns of the last year. You know, growth is not just supported by services consumption anymore. It's really, you know, much more broad than that. You know, it's good spending, it's investment in, in those types of components. So if you take a step back, uh, you listen to all these people saying that consumers are slowing, but not that much, and that you are seeing the economy slow, but not that much, and you're going to get this disinflation that's going to lead to a perfect soft landing. What's your main pushback about why inflation is going to remain sticky and why this is going to become a persistent problem that the Fed's going to have to address more aggressively? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really does come down to, you know, when we're, we're doing inflation forecasts, we're looking at you know, the different components and the drivers of it, you know, and a lot of different, you know, components, like what I mentioned in, in goods, you know, those, you know, prices are kind of ticking up again. You know, we've, that's been a lot of the disinflation of the last year, you know, from supply chains correcting and commodity prices falling. Well, those stories have kind of reached an end and commodity prices are rising again. And, you know, if we look at the, the current disinflation, you know, what we expect to see in the next couple months, a lot of that will come from components like shelter inflation. And that's just reflecting that, you know, home prices fell into 2022, rents have slowed, but the last four months of home price data, you know, we've seen those prices rising again. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to believe that, you know, if we're not slowing enough, if we're not, you know, in a you know scenario that looks like a recession, well, then you just get some inflation coming right back and you're just stably at something like three to four percent. When you talk about market action and at what point the Fed is actually transmitting their policy through the long end of the yield curve, Veronica, how much has the yield uh, move higher that we've seen to the highest levels going back to 2007 created a greater pressure that could actually knock inflation down more uh, versus actually being sustainable and something that we see over a longer period of time? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the moves, of course, and, and longer end yields that we've had in the last couple of weeks are tightening financial conditions. You know, that will help slow things down. You know, we do still have a recession in our in our base case for next year, you know, because of this you know, tightening of financial conditions. And yeah, the, the transmission of, of higher rates really didn't you know, flow through with the normal you know, four to six quarter lag that we were expecting. And maybe that's because you know, you know, corporations have turned out their debts. You know, people are just not, you know, as sensitive to high rates. Um, but that doesn't mean that they won't be as as those kinds of you know factors fade. Um, so I think you can still expect some some slowing at some point from from higher rates. Um, but the Fed's own forecast, you know, kind of incorporated that higher for longer narrative. But you really didn't see it in their growth forecast. You know, the the Fed is still very much on this you know ideal soft landing kind of path. <laughs> to be clear, Veronica, which measurement of disinflation do you and Andrew use? Are you wedded like I am to three month annualized because it was beaten into me as a young uh, child? Or do you use another measurement here of the gradient of disinflation? Yeah, I think something like a three month, three month annualized is a good way to look at the current trend. Um, you know, obviously there's been a lot of focus the last year or so on, on the core non shelter services. You know, those are the you know services like recreation or transportation, you know, that are, are tied really to tight labor markets and strong wage growth. So we, we look at all of those measures. Um, but in the end, you know, the you know, the most important measure is the one that the Fed will be targeting, and that's you know, total PCE inflation, and of course they'll look at core inflation um, and all of those components do matter, you know, the, the path for goods prices or, or shelter, it all does matter. It all is measuring, you know, what people are spending. Uh, Veronica, thank you so much. Veronica Clark Thanks. was Citigroup this morning, and here the 10-year yield really on the cusp of a 4.53 and four uh, basis points. Just sigh of relief on a Friday after, uh, what a week. Yeah, but a sigh of relief to what level? I mean, if you had said a sigh of relief to 4.55% on a 10-year Treasury yield, uh, you know, a week ago, people would say that's not much of a sigh of relief, Tom. Oh, it's good. We're going to have to see here as well. Let's do a data check. We advance up, uh, well, up 1% on the NASDAQ 100, 15,000 level. Wow. On NASDAQ 100. On the Standard & Poor's 500, up 31 points. We are up seven-tenths of a percent. Lisa? We are looking right now at fairly muted uh, reactions to this data. But what I find interesting is that U.S. core PCE uh, prices posted the smallest monthly rise since late 2020. For, so those in the disinflation camp, this might be a breath of fresh air, a little bit of good news, which is maybe why you're seeing a bit of bid to the tape in this sort of sigh of relief that you talk about on this Friday after a pretty tough, uh, tough week. It's, it's been a pretty tough week, but again, into the data dependency. And of course, the importance here of 10 a.m. Stay with Bloomberg News, radio and television here. I mean, Lisa, it's 8.42. In an hour and 15 minutes, the world changes. We hear the Speaker of the House, and we hear, am I correct, UAW on Facebook? 10 a.m. All Facebook at the same Live. time. Two yeah. separate stories. Two separate stories, but related yeah. to uh, the angst that we're at right now, the, both the uh, political wrangling, but also whether people are going to demand more at a time when inflation is challenging what they can spend. That said, I do think it's interesting when you take a look at some of the granularity of the data that real personal spending surprised to the upside. So what I find interesting is despite what you're seeing with uh, perhaps for a couple of years, Year's inflation outpacing wage increases. You're still seeing people spend. Right. Savings were supposed to be out. People are still spending, and that continues. Oh, the quiet there's uh, there. And, you know, I go back. You've, it's like a broken record, folks. I'm sorry. The 10 year real yield, 2.16%, certainly pulling back from the shock of what we saw on Wednesday uh, as well. Matt Miller really helping us out with the auto story today. He emails in and says, Tom, Bitcoin, quote it. 27,000, 26,994 on BitDog. We only do that for Matthew Miller. That really helps with the auto story. It really helps with the pay, auto you're story. You're going to pay for your EV Crypto, with, uh, yeah. with Bitcoin? It's going to be interesting to see. The VIX down over a stick. That gives me a good market. S&P futures up 31. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. We're at very low supplies. There's going to be a tremendous strain on the market, already is. We're seeing it now in the front end of the curve, a tremendous amount of premium called backwardation 
today's prices greater than next month's prices. It's a clear signal that the market is undersupplied. There's too much demand. And again, we'll need prices to go even higher here to even out uh, and bring this market back into equilibrium. The inelasticity of the oil market. Stephen Shore, principal of the Shore Group, really interesting on that dynamic earlier this morning. One thing that I'm watching, uh, Tom, this morning is just some of the consumer discretionary stocks after a real tumultuous, tumultuous I'll get it out, quarter you like me, be where you get the sense uh, that this is the area that's been most beaten up. Oh, wait, maybe not. Nike shares up more than 10 percent after reporting that they've been uh, really working down some of their inventories. And you can see the commensurate move in Dick Sporting Goods and Under Armour. Those shares up more than 2%, both just to the knock on effects of clearing inventory and suddenly getting back control over pricing power. And Tom, I do wonder when you take a step back whether you are starting to see on the margins consumer discretionary clearing out some I'm, of the angst and then able yeah. to pass along some of the higher mm-hmm. prices more aggressively to consumers. It really speaks to a different moment than this sort of like soft landing, this feeling that we're seeing a real right. kind of weakness in my, the economy. My head's spinning. I want to talk to Michelle Meyer at MasterCard. I want to see what the charge cards are really speaking uh, right now. We'll have to see on that. A busy morning here. Futures up 29, Dow futures up 200. We are up a stick. Yeah, up a stick on the NASDAQ right now, 15,000. On luxury, Oliver Chen joins senior equity research analyst Cowan, also a study uh, on the faculty, I should say, Columbia uh, Business School this morning. Okay, I'm going to do a pitch in at the Sunset Tower in London. I'm wearing my Hermes. I'm wearing this. I'm wearing my Dior. And I'm going, guys, it works. Breakfast at Costco. It just is not as romantic as breakfast at Tiffany's. Is luxury dead? Luxury is not that. It's a very resilient industry. And even at Costco, which has a higher household income, you can get great diamonds, great fine wine. But what's happening is consumers are looking for retailers with very low prices and retailers that can charge a lot. So luxury and value continue to work. And the consumer spending, Lisa, 3.8% unemployment, money on the sidelines. There's plenty of spending power, rapid shifts. What is good is inventories are in better position. So Costco inventories are running negative. It's putting them in a great place. That's happening across the sector, and we'll see easier compares. Oliver, it happens in the news business, a death in Washington. We're going to have to go to that. Oliver Chen, we deserve to have a long conversation with you in a bit. She was the mayor of San Francisco for 10 years, and no one expected 30 years plus in the United States Senate. Dianne Feinstein of California, always of San Francisco, has died. An an important moment here. It has been a story for 2023 as she provided Democratic Party leadership for over 30 years in Washington. Our Anne-Marie Horton provides perspective now. Anne-Marie, your thoughts on the passing of Dianne Feinstein? Well, Tom, um, it's a very sad day for individuals in Washington getting this news and NBC reporting this and Punchbowl News reporting this. She was an absolute trailblazer, one of two of the first women to ever be elected to the Senate. And she is, was the longest serving woman in the Senate. And there's a number of accolades we can talk about her, Tom, whether it's not the fact that she really was driving home legislation, whether it was about gun control laws in the 90s or gay rights and for the LGBTQ community. Uh, This is going to be a sad day for many, uh, everyone in Washington, not just the Democratic Party, but also Republicans as well. And Marie, uh, was this expected? I mean, not just because of her age, but just in general because of deteriorating health? Well, she's 90 years old. Um, We do know that she had a bout with shingles and then she came back to Congress. And when you see her, she's being wheeled. She has been been wheeled around in the halls of Congress in a wheelchair. So it's been a very sad state of affairs uh, for for the senator. And a lot of attention has been put on her just because of her age. And and there was, of course, a moment over the summer when she was told how to Mm -hmm. vote. She seemed confused and she was told just vote uh, A on this. So that's uh, that's why she's been a big focus over this summer. Um, 
But obviously, uh, she was still showing up to work every day um, with a lot of help and care. But she was still working as a senator from California. But she was 90 years old and had a, a very difficult health situation she was dealing with. And Maria, when you talk about her legacy and you talked about all of the different uh, generations that she really led through, what is the ultimate legacy that she's going to leave behind? And really, who takes the helm from California to pick up where she left off? Well, it's going to be some big shoes to fill when you've given um, all of the, really, the glass ceilings that Senator Feinstein continuously broke, not just being the first uh, female mayor of San Francisco, but she was the first female to lead the Judiciary Committee. Uh, this is an individual who was a trailblazer for women, but also key legislation, as I mentioned, especially when it came to um, gay rights and the LGBTQ community, as well as... Um, uh, when you talk about gun control legislation, right. these were things she was very passionate about. California Governor Gavin Newsom said he would make an interim choice if Feinstein wanted to vacate her seat. There was discussions of whether or not she was going to come back to, se to the Senate when she was dealing with these health concerns. And that's what right. he said. And, and, I, and I imagine um, that's what you would expect from the governor of California at some point. Obviously, um, people will potentially, there'll be whispers of that talk today, right. but I think everyone today is going to want to make sure that they are um, doing justice to the legacy of this individual. There's no question the focus today will be on Senator Feinstein, but Anne-Marie, George Skelton in the Los Angeles Times, with grace and dignity, speaks of what the governor of California has to do, and there's a legacy here. With Abraham Lincoln, there's a legacy here with, I believe it was FDR, in that President Biden would suggest to the governor that the vice president would be an appropriate new senator for California. I mean, not today, I agree, but in the coming days, that's got to be topic one, right? Well, I think there's a lot of individuals who potentially would like to see that, actually, and potentially to see Biden maybe look elsewhere for a running mate for the upcoming right. election. Obviously, that is rumors and speculation, and that is something I cannot speak to with facts, right. especially at this moment. At this moment, Anne-Marie, what I find fascinating here is a set of conservatives had an immense respect for Dianne Feinstein's permanent liberal trajectory. It was remarkable to me how the conservatives respected the month after month effort she made for liberal politics. Who are those people on Capitol Hill? I mean, how will Senator McConnell respond to this passing? I think Senator McConnell will come out with a heartfelt message about Senator Feinstein. I mean, even though these individuals don't agree all the times when it comes to policy, uh, right. Feinstein was also known to want to work in a bipartisan uh, manner, and she has. Um, and I think she is greatly respected on the right, even if you did not agree with some of the policies that she wanted to enact uh, in, in mm -hmm. Congress. But this is someone who definitely wanted to work with, almost feels like in another time of how our politics yeah, work. Yeah, well Someone said. who really did reach across the aisle. Yeah, this is just really important, folks, from In Another Time, a topic for Balance of Power uh, this evening. Amory Horton, and look for Joe Matthew as well, Balance of Power uh, here. Dianne Feinstein dead at 90. We are here on a Friday, and we're going to say to Oliver Chen of Cowan, boy, you need to come back, and we're sorry that we had to interrupt that important conversation uh, for this news uh, from Washington. Uh, Lisa, I don't know, you know, is it like short squeeze Friday? Is that what we're calling this? Well, as we move uh, from the news that we will be following throughout the day of the legacy of the longest serving Congresswoman, we are also looking at a rally that is trying to make up for some of the losses, some of the carnage over the past quarter. Yeah. It really has been a difficult one. The most interesting aspect to me is that yet again, bonds and stocks are moving in tandem. So we're not moving away from that correlated world that's giving some people angst. This feels like it is a move in tandem as the market resets. Yeah. Disinversion in place at uh, real yield, which we've completely lost perspective on the 10-year real yield, 2.16%. Uh, I should note Brent crude into the weekend, $96 uh, a barrel. We'll be watching a gallon of gas here through October. 
and into, uh, frankly, into 2024. Dollar dynamics, dollar fractionally stronger off the large set of economic data that Michael McKee gave us. The yen in the news here. Look for our, our uh, conversation on the yen Sunday evening, New York time as they open uh, there. We leave you with a senator from California, always from San Francisco, Diane Feinstein.